Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa, ka mihi mahana, warmest greetings to, and acknowledgements to mana whenua, members of the public, the media, staff and elected members. Welcome to this, the Community and Culture Committee uh, of meeting of today, Tuesday, November the 17th, 2020. Uh, for the benefit of those who have not been here before, I will just quickly go over the Edinburgh Room housekeeping. So the toilets, Faripaku, are through that door over there, closest to the projector screens. Um, fire evacu evacuation procedures leave the building via the stairs and assemble in front of the Civic Centre. If you can't exit this way, follow staff who will take everyone across the air bridge to the Civic Centre. <coughs> Earthquake procedures remain in the building. It's safer. Move away from windows and any equipment and furniture which may topple. Take shelter under solid furniture such as tables and hold on. Uh, in all cases, follow instructions given by fire warden, civil defence officers, emergency services. Kelda for your indulgence in that part. Um, we have no public forum speakers and move to apologies. Uh, apologies have been received from Councillor Doug Hall, Councillor David Benson Pope, and Councillor Christine Geary for lateness. Are there any further apologies? I'll move. Uh, do I have a seconder? I'll move that these be accepted. Thank you, Councillor O'Malley. Uh, all in favour? Those against? Any abstentions? Motion carried. Thank you. Item three, confirmation of the agenda. Um, I move that the committee confirms the agenda without addition or alteration. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Elder. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? Any abstentions? Motion carried. Declarations of interest. Um, apart from His Worship's amendment of yesterday, are there any other updates? Okay, so I'll move that the committee amends the or notes the amendment of the uh, elected members interest register and confirms um, the proposed management plan for elected members interests. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Houlihan. All those in favour? Thank you. Those against? Abstentions? Motion carried. Item five, confirmation of the minutes of the meeting of uh, this committee on the 22nd of September, page 18 of your order papers. Um, do we have any questions, matters arising from that? Okay, so I'm going to move that the committee confirms the minutes of the Community and Culture Committee meeting held on 22nd of September 2020 as a correct record. Thank you, Councillor Ulan. Have a seconder. All those in favour? Those against? Abstentions? Motion carry. Thank you very much. Move on to minutes of committees. Toitu Otago Settler Museum Board of 5th of October 2020. Anyone willing to move? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Alder. We have a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Okay, so um, the committee notes the, me the minutes of the Toitu. Otago Settlers Museum Board Meeting held on 5th of October 2020. All those in favour? Against? Anyone abstaining? Thank you. The motion is carried. Item 7, Community and Culture Committee Forward Work Programme, page 26. Okay, so the report has... You've read the report. Any, any dis questions or do you want to say anything? Okay. Any questions? Thank you, Councillor Staines. Okay, thank you, Councillor uh, Houlihan. So uh, we have a mover and a seconder that the committee notes the Community and Culture Committee Forward Work Programme. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? Any abstentions? Thank you, the motion is carried. Item 8, actions from resolutions of Community and Culture Committee meetings. Uh, that's page 29 of our order papers. Uh, do you want to speak to this? Okay. Any, any questions, any discussion? Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Okay, so we are moving, or well, Councillor Walker and His Worship have moved and seconded the, that the committee notes the open and completed actions from resolutions of community and culture committee. All those in favour? 
Opposed against or any abstentions? Thank you, the motion is carried. Item nine, Otago Museum report to contributing local authorities uh, up to the 30th of September 2020. It's page 35 of your order papers. And we welcome uh, the director of the Otago Museum, Dr. Ian Griffin, to speak to this report. Welcome, sir. Uh, kia ora. Thank you. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, uh, in, uh, so some top level things first of all. Um, we're now, um, what is it, nine months into the COVID crisis and um, we can start to see the impact that the lack of tourists is having on the institutions. Um, up to the end of this report, uh, the museum was running about 21% behind the visitor numbers of the year before. Uh, we actually had an excellent half term which isn't reported on in this report and we've clawed back, we're about 14% down on the same time last year. Um, so the, the impact is there, but um, we've managed to kind of finagle some other um, things like dinosaurs that are helping generate some income to keep us going. And um, the museum's in a very stable situation at the moment. We think we're um, stable right the way through to the end of this financial year. And um, depending on how we go post Christmas, um, I think we should be okay next year as well. Um, in terms of this report, um, it did cover the period that we went back to level two, a little bit of yo-yoing around, and um, the staff did a fantastic job making sure the building was safe. Um, incidentally, I would like to mention um, the museum team put together, in collaboration with the University of Otago, this paper that was published in the Journal of Conservation Studies about how to safely reopen a museum uh, after a pandemic, and that was published in an international journal in the UK. Uh, so that's some of the byproduct of this, this period we're going through. Um, I would mention uh, also that during the period covered by this report, the museum opened its online shop, and we're now starting to see about $1,000 a week of sales through that across the country. Uh, so we're getting people in Auckland buying material from the Otago Museum shop, which is great. Um, in terms of exhibitions, um, subsequent to this report, we opened our dinosaurs exhibition, which is going gangbusters. Um, but during this uh, period, we also opened a really lovely display on our stairwell about uh, Papua New Guinea. And that's been a fabulous exhibition. It's going to be there for a while. We also um, opened an exhibition on climate change that was um, created by students, which has been very popular. And we recently hosted the Otago Hall of Fame. Um, there's, as usual, a lot in this report. And um, rather than go on and on, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Are there any questions, councillors, the report? Yes, Councillor Lord. Yeah, um, thanks, Dr. Griffin. That is a good report. I was just going to ask a question about you were saying the, the numbers being only 14% behind. There must be more Kiwis travelling. Is that what you're finding? Yes, um, we've, we've done a couple of initial surveys and we are seeing more people from outside of South Island. Yeah. So, Do you know how the numbers that are down would correlate to what you would normally get from overseas? Like, um, like obviously the effect, because there's more Kiwis travelling, has not been fully as bad so has the do you know how many overseas tourists you would generally get well um we normally in an, in, a, in an average year we get somewhere between 20 and 30 percent depending on season um so we're seeing zero, obviously zero now and um so the numbers being down by about 14 percent at the moment um that's it's it shows that perhaps half 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 the, the, the kiwis are making up half of what the previous international travel was but that's very hand wavy i can't that's, that's just a hand wave estimate, really. Thank you. Councillor Barker? Good Dr Griffin. Uh, I just wonder whether you benchmark your figures against the um, Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment major regional tourism estimate, the MRTEs. Is that, have you been following those? And no. We, yeah. um, at the moment, we've... Sorry, there's, a, there's another project we're working on, mm. which is master planning, so we haven't done any analysis mm -hmm. on that, but it's one of the things we will look at. Um, but from our perspective, it's still early days. Mm. Uh, but they, I, they know they're a very powerful benchmark. So we, I don't know if you've had a chance to do it yourself, but I haven't. Oh, I, you know, I, I've got them for the, for the last year. I just like, wanted to compliment you also on how well you've done um, giving those numbers and giving what's actually how Dunedin's performing. Yeah, I think Dunedin's, I mean, from our perspective, Dunedin's doing well. We've been very lucky because we've got the perf what we consider to be the perfect post-COVID exhibition with dinosaurs, and um, that's helping us a lot. Um, but it is still troubling, and um, you know, if the numbers stay down even 14% year on year, it's going to be challenging going forward, I think. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Elder. 
I too want to congratulate you on your results. 14% um, down compared to 21% down is a big difference. So well done on attracting people. Um, and I'm just going to ask about that. Um, you have a lot of um, events going on, um, displays going on, and like the dinosaur door supply, dis display. Um, how do you feel those events are attracting people? Well, they're going very well, actually. I mean, in fact, on Friday night, we had a, a Friday the 13th thing after dark, and that was targeted at, um, shall we say, a, a more mature audience. And we had a capacity of 300, and that was sold out. Um, you've probably, you mentioned yourself, we've got these Mesmerica music shows going on in the planetarium yes. at the moment, and we're, that's entirely run from a, a company in America. They're basically hiring the dome, and they're doing all the marketing. Mm -hmm. And I think they've sold out 12 shows. So um, that kind of stuff, what we're trying to do is, in these times, we can't just traditionally re rely on our traditional family audience. We, we, obviously, with dinosaurs, we're catering to that, but we're trying to extend the audience by doing these other things. Now, sometimes they work, like the After Dark programs are, are very successful. Um, sometimes they don't. Uh, so we've, been, we've, we've had a, a run of luck at the moment, but I'm sure we will find something that doesn't work um, occasionally as well. So um, related to that, I mean, these, these are, are shows that anyone from throughout New Zealand would want to go and see, and, and their children. Um, what kind of marketing are you doing in the marketplace for the domestic market? Um, well, we've, uh, one of the consequences of COVID-19 is we've, we've slashed our marketing budget by half. So we're, not do, we're doing relatively small amounts of paid advertising. Uh, we still advertise in the ODT. We do the occasional adverts, um, uh, social media stuff. But we've cut our, our marketing budget's gone back about $50,000 this year, simply because we, were, we, we made the decision that we're going to try and preserve staff positions. Mm. And one of the things that we could cut back was marketing. Uh, but it, having said that, I think we're doing, our marketing team are doing a really great job, and we are getting the numbers through the door. So um, I, don't, I think it's proven to us that maybe we could, in, focus, in future, refocus our marketing efforts in different ways, because we're not seeing that much of a fall off at the moment. Um, noting um, a number of places I've visited recently, everywhere I've, I've visited, um, there have been people from Christchurch in Dunedin. I went to Larnock Castle, people from Christchurch. Uh, I went to uh, Signal Hill, people from Christchurch biking on the hill. So is there any reach into Christchurch, given that there appears to be a lot of movement from Christchurch towards Dunedin in the tourism market, domestic tourism market? I wouldn't necessarily say we've, we've, we've certainly not taken out adverts in Christchurch newspapers. Um, however, having said that, our social media targeting does reach that audience. Um, and we, you know, we're basically asking for dinosaurs reaching family audiences, and that goes out through Facebook, and that seems to bring people in quite well. And I know Mesmerica has been astonishing. I mean, I, I, I don't know a person who hasn't seen a Mesmerica thing on Instagram or Facebook, so whatever they're doing is amazing too. So I think it does show that the traditional media, while it's still important, especially for the local market, um, you can use other media which are somewhat more cost effective. Um, but I, you know, in these times, we also want to support the local market, the, the local yes. media industry too. So we, we would always invest in lo some some of that, but most of that would be around here in Dunedin, Otago, rather than across the country. And had you realised that the dinosaur exhibition was one of the places to go to in the Air New Zealand um, yeah. magazine? No, I hadn't. I, uh, I, we, with COVID, I've only flown once this year, and <laughs> so I've not read the Air New Zealand magazine for about six months or so. Um, but no, it's great, and that was actually free. We didn't pay for that, which is great as well. Yes. So, I'll be attending. <laughs> Any further questions? Yes, Councillor Wiley. Um, actually, it's not quite a question. I'll phrase that straight. I just want to acknowledge the Otago Museum in winning an award on um, Friday night in the um, Westpac Business Awards. Awesome job and a great achievement for the organisation. Oh, thank you, Noel. Thank you. Well, I did, actually, I did actually acknowledge that I felt we, uh, we, we, we robbed on the evening, so in my speech. But um, no, it's a, it was a really tough category this year, and, and Volunteer South were fantastic as well. Um, so we were all winners, really, on the night. <laughs> OK. Um, I'm, I'm happy, very happy. I thank you very much for the, um, your reports. They're always um, interesting and detailed. And um, thank you for that.
and I'd just like to move that the committee notes of the Otago Museum report to contributing local authorities of the 30th of September 2020. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Gary. All those in favour? Those against? Any abstentions? Thank you. The motion is carried. Thank you, Dr Griffin, and congratulations again. Item 10, Community and Culture Activity Report for the quarter ending 30th of September. Mr Dixon, Ms Pinfold and Mrs Lanini, welcome. Do you have prefacing comments to make to your report or? Um, I just had one and that um, uh, this was not a hint to any of our councillors that you should be building your own home uh, but this I just thought um, our report mentions this uh, pamphlet for homeowners and anyone looking to build or develop in Dunedin and I thought it would be useful to provide that to you in hard copy today. Kia ora for that. Are, any, are there any questions of the report? Yes, Councillor Barker. Just trying to get them in a logical order. I'll just start, obviously, since we've heard from the Otago Museum about um, their figures and being um, benchmarked against the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment's major regional tourism estimates. Is there, um, are you aware of those figures, of, of those statistics available? I'm aware, but not across the detail, Councillor. Okay. I, I just wondered if um, the institutions and attractions who've reported on their numbers, are, are they benchmarked against the MRTEs or against any other performance of any other attractions in Dunedin? Um, well, frankly, they're benchmarked against pre previous performance uh, as presented in, in the report. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Next question is around the Creative Dunedin Partnership. And on the, the website under the Creative Dunedin Partnership, uh, there's responsibilities reporting and review. It states that the Creative Dunedin Partnership will report formally to the DCC at the end of August on the year's progress. We might, we, when might we expect to see a report on our Aratoi strategy and accomplishments? Uh, well, we're actually meeting this week, um, and I... Um I will raise that at, that at that meeting, and I'm sure that we can prepare a report in short order. Thank you. The next question, in the council meeting of the 30th of June, council allocated $75,000 to reconnecting Aute Porti events. Can I please ask for an update on what is happening or planned for this fund in these events? In the document we were given, it said that... Um, development of events within the city to reconnect the community and draw people into the city centre and other key areas. Staff would partner with groups to develop events to be held from September through to June, additional to civic events already run. And I can't find any reporting on that in this activity report about where, where the status of this is. Uh, kia ora councillor, so um, we've had some discussions with three place-based groups across the city about that. Uh, I think the timing of those discussions has been at points where groups were a little bit concerned. We just were coming out of level two again, um, and so there was some concern about looking at those before Christmas. Uh, we are continuing discussions with place-based groups, and, and we've identified that it, the discussions should be partnerships between place-based groups and business associations, just to ensure that there's an economic... Um, the focus of that funding was to try and support both an economic and social wellbeing approach within communities. So they're continuing, mm -hmm. and we'll provide another update in, uh, at the next meeting. So when you talk about place-based groups, given that they um, reconnect in the community and draw people into the city centre, what are the place-based groups that you're talking to? Um, well, the, it mentions other parts of the city. So we, we've um, so far had conversations with Greater Green Island, Mosgiel, and North East Valley. But not Place the centre groups. city. Not in the city okay. as yet. Cool. Thank you. Um, I just want to go back to the visitor institutions, I guess. Obviously, they've um, taken a big hit with the number of visitors. I just wonder if you have what percentage of international visitors came into most of the attractions, just a rule of thumb. Um, well, that's not, not specific data that we collect, mm. but in, 
anecdotally, um, Alverston was overwhelmingly visited by international visitors, something between 85 and 90 percent. Um, the art gallery um, has a um, has a good mix across, but is, is actually attract and it attracts and continues to attract broad audiences from across New Zealand. Uh, Toitu is more local um, uh, operation, and um, as its focus is much more on the on the on the story of the of the city. I, on reading the statistics, I saw that um, September was around 33% down, and I just comment that the graphs make it quite hard to put a percentage on and guess the numbers. And then the MRTE sort of say that Dunedin was down 23% for those visitors from out of town. So I'm just a little concerned around that, and also given that we just heard from the Otago Museum about their figures, I think they were sort of 21% before they hit around now, and now they're negative 14%. Um, given that the visitation is down so much, have there been or are there plan any restructuring or any other plans, like the museum said that they slashed their marketing budget in half to help the institutions and attractions weather COVID? Well, there's two things I'd point out, Councillor. Um, the first is at Olverston, which has been very acutely hit. Um, the manager there has worked very um, in a very focused way to develop a whole new set of offerings. Um, to the public, including jazz on the lawn and murder mystery weekends and, and, and uh, Edwardian high teas and so on. And in fact, to date, by which I mean actually to the end of October, has actually managed to um, generate more revenue from those lines than she's lost through um, the visitor tickets. Awesome. So that she's going very well. I should say that as the summer moves on, I suspect those graphs will st start to look slightly different. Um, at um, Toitu and the Art Gallery, um, we're very pleased that we've actually got to the point where we can now appoint um, an audience development manager, which is one of the um, last um, follows through from the restructuring that happened a little while ago. That will significantly beef up the, um, the work of that department and enable us to take a more strategic view at developing audiences both for the Art Gallery and Toy 2 and in association with um, colleagues in the events and festivals, we're going to be a lot more, um, we've got more capacity and more strategic thinking in that area before the end of the year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councillor Elder. I'm glad you're having murder mysteries at Alveston. Um, and I, um, one, of, one of the things, I was, I was at a meeting the other day and um, the comment was made that a lot of people are still not confident to get out and that is in the local community, like older people, etc, because they're scared, still that fear in the community. Um, is there any messaging we can do to um, encourage people to get out and that it's safe to get out now? I don't know whether that's affecting numbers, but I know anecdotally, especially with the older group, that it's happening. Um, Council, I think we're led by public health messaging, and at the moment there's no public health messaging that actually says it's safe. It doesn't actually say it's unsafe, but I think we would, we would need to be led by public health messaging. Okay. We are cognisant of that, however, so um, you will have noted for the first time um, we actually live streamed Armistice Day, um, and that was particularly um, being very aware that older people who, who may usually go to that may not feel comfortable. And um, Thieves Alley in 2021, we are reducing the number of stalls for that to allow for more room <coughs> between mm. stalls, so more comfortable spaces for people to try and ease some of that anxiety. Oh, thank you for that, because I, I just thought maybe that's affecting the library numbers in particular. Um, the other thing is, um, as noted before, um, I'm noting that there's a lot of people from Christchurch coming here, like a major amount, and I was wondering whether in fact, because we have a wonderful suite of um, facilities, which we have, um, would there be a possibility to actually marketing into that market? Everywhere I go, it's Christchurch people. 
We're working closely with Enterprise Dunedin on that whole marketing Dunedin piece. Um, they are still developing their plans from their successful um, application for STAP funding, and um, I'm in active dialogue with, with uh, that team around how we can make progress in exactly the area you described, <coughs> Councillor. Um, in particular, I want to congratulate you on having a Colin McCann exhibition and then a Ralph Hawtery, which are of New Zealand interest and um, could attract a lot of people to Dunedin. And would could that be a, a, a focus of marketing out there? Uh, we're very proud of both of those shows. Yes. Um, uh, and we do anticipate significant draw from across New Zealand. Of course, it's unlikely to attract visitors from, from Christchurch as the Hotary will be going to Christchurch after here. Um, the marketing for the art gallery tends to be quite um, uh, specific and through its, through its social media channels, um, but I will certainly factor this into the conversation I'm having with the enterprise to need and around, around that precise area. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, um, Car Council Gary. Sorry. Thank you, Councillor Luffy. So, uh, item number 41, uh, which is around the expression of interest for the Taroni Reserve refurbishment, was reissued. Could you just explain that a little more? Page 79. Was it felt that, that you needed a, a, a wider I think, I think number of... Yeah, I think that was um, following the uh, engagement with Mana Whenua, right? And I think there was a slight um, adjustment to the okay. um, to the, uh, um, the, the, the the text. The of brief. The, of the okay, thank you. That's really helpful to know. And item fifty-three, um, paragraph fifty-three, uh, which was about the cities of literature. Um, the two Dunedin poets translated into Russian and read to audiences on the city's trams at night, I found intriguing. I'd love to know, um, because it wasn't noted here, who were the two poets, Dunedin poets? I'll need to get back to you on that, oh, thank you. I will. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr Dixon, Ms Pinfold and Mrs Lanini, and congratulations on your October Labour Weekend wedding. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to move that the committee notes the community and culture activity report for the quarter ending 30th of September 2020. Uh, thank you Councillor Houlihan for seconding. All those in favour? Those against? Any abstentions? Oh did you want to discuss it? You're very welcome to. Just wanted to have my little piece. Um, as I've said many times in the last year, my key concern is with our city strategies and that we are implementing monitoring and reporting on them. There are two strategies that I would expect to see reporting on in this committee, the Aratoi and the social wellbeing strategies. While it's encouraging to see some great activities, I'm concerned with outcomes and whether we are following our strategies. We've um, invested a huge amount in creating them. My other concern is the COVID impact on our visitor facing attractions. The benchmark MB MRTEs that I keep going on about show that Dunedin is um, underperforming. Uh, great news in July, plus 8%, August negative 11%, and September negative 23%. So it was very interesting, and that's why I was asking about the benchmark benchmarking of um, visitor attractions and trying to understand our Dunedin's exposure to international and out-of-town domestic visitors and then understand how we as council can mitigate the serious effects on our income from these visitors. Um, also how we can future-proof our city's in institutions and attractions. We invest around $26, $27 million each year in our libraries and museums um, with around $2 million in external revenue to offset some of these costs. I'm expecting the big hits on numbers to come over summer. We've all seen the graphs and how they're going. So I do want to feel comfortable that council is addressing what could be a larger dent in the council's coffers and income. I was therefore quite happy to hear today from council officers that they were taking a strategic look at those issues. Councillor, Councillor Houlihan. Thank you, <coughs> excuse me, thank you Chair. Um, yes, well, as a city, we, 
we are looking like normal, you know, we're walking around without masks most of the time and it, it seems to a lot of people that things look really good. But what I can tell you is that underneath all of that image that we give out, we are certainly doing a lot better than places overseas, but our artists, many of them are really hurting. Now I know quite a few, of, some of you were at the community grants um, workshop that was on recently and it was sobering and I think that's where we really need to look at Aratoi and what we can do for the artists in the city and the creative sector um, so I really look forward to like um, Councillor Barker said seeing that strategy and also seeing I know we are doing some things to help artists but I just want to highlight their plight that some of the stories that were shared on that day were as I said very sobering one um, musician talked about how he worked part-time as a creative writer and then the rest of the time he used to make money as a musician. That work has now dried up because a lot of the places he used to play don't, you know, just haven't got the numbers, people don't want to come out. Um, and he said some people in his network have actually committed suicide. Um, things are tough. And this community, this committee, um, does cover the arts and the creative sector. And it is something that during a time where they can't have audiences, <clears throat> and we can now, but people are slow in coming out and actually getting back to seeing uh, you know, performances and things, I think that's something we really need to be aware of and look at actively supporting the artists in our city. Kia ora, Councillor Elder. Apologies to um, more seasoned politicians. I was just in a hurry to finish the agenda because I'm sure people are interested in the next committee's agenda. So apologies that I didn't actually uh, make room for this. Make <laughs> Thank room you. For this. Thank you. Um, I just want to um, congratulate um, our um, amazing suite of cultural institutions for some of the dynamic things they're doing out there. To get Colin McCann, Ralph Haltery in the art gallery is, is a massive thing. Um, to see Olveston doing murder weekends or nights and high teas and, and, and to hear of the art, um, the Toitu, not Toitu, um, the shop in the museum selling a thousand dollars a week from their shop um, online which is just amazing adaptability um, and, and what I would like to see um, and following up on from what Sophie said is these, this suite of cultural institutions we've got is New Ze worldwide class because we're, we're, we're such a small city and you can walk to all of them so I believe that this is an opportunity for us to actually um, tell our story elsewhere. Um, I also want to thank um, the library, and I, I went to the South Dunedin um, Hui, and at, the, at that there was um, free books for preschoolers and, and school children for the whole greater South Dunedin area, and I just think this initiative is, is really amazing, and I congratulate the library and and those who worked on this project, I think it's fantastic. Um, so yeah, I think we're doing amazing stuff in our cultural institutions. We just need to tell that story to everybody else. Um, and um, I thank the people for all the work that they've done. Thank you, thank you for your indulgence. Oh, plus this. Yes, all right, I'm gonna put the motion. All those in favor? Sorry, yes, your worship. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to add my um, thanks publicly in this forum to the staff at the Dunedin Public Art Gallery and our friends up the road at the Christchurch Art Gallery for uh, the work that has gone into putting together uh, Artete to resist uh, the, the Ralph Hawtrey mm -hmm. uh, retrospective, the first um, significant retrospective uh, of his work since his passing in, in 2013. And that, that hasn't been an easy task curatorially or politically as some of you may have read uh, over the weekend um, but it is a, an overwhelming body of work uh, and, a, and a truly uh, it is an exhibition of international significance in my view and 
Um, we're, we're lucky to have so much of uh, Ralph's legacy to be able to draw on both artistically and politically uh, in, in, the, in the work that is, is on display. So I just wanted to have that recorded here. And, and thanks also to people who so generously parted with the works in their private collections temporarily. I know it's, um, it's always anxious when things, particularly at that, at that end of the spectrum, leave your doors and, and coming into public view and will now travel to Christchurch before they come back. But it is a, a remarkable act of, of generosity to do that and, and, and very much in keeping with the spirit of, of the artist who created them. So I just wanted to add my thanks to those people too. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Um, thank you, Councillor Defiso. Um, I'm delighted to hear of the interest and focus around this table um, on the art sector. And I just wanted to note uh, that this council can be really proud of the fact it hasn't cut funding in this area, uh, that we've shown great flexibility to accommodate um, the uh, changing needs of those organising uh, events, uh, including artistic events due to COVID, um, and we've shown the greatest flexibility that we can with that. Um, mindful that we're always accountable to the ratepayers in terms of it being public money, but we've been very responsible in that regard and shown flexibility to accommodate that changing situation. Uh, we've increased our community grants. Um, and our organisations, our cultural organisations, have been nimble, flexible, and all of those buzzwords have pivoted. Um, and initiatives like the Community of Readers uh, are extraordinary in these times. So I'm looking forward to my colleagues around this table supporting the art sector, supporting Aratoi through the long-term plan when we reach that place. Are there any further speakers? <laughs> I have already spoken, but can I just say, just backing what the Mayor said, Hotary was amazing. And I, would, I went to Hotary and I'm really pleased I went to it. And there was at least, I think, maybe 500 plus people there. It was excellent. Thank you for your indulgence uh, of other politicians uh, for allowing Council Lillian to speak a second time. Okay, I'm gonna put the motion now. Uh, all those in favour? <laughs> Against? Abstentions, thank you, the motion is carried. And we move to item 11, the final item. Are there any items for consideration by the chair? There being none, I declare this meeting closed and thank you very much for your patience.
Hello to everyone and welcome to today's Planning and Environment Committee meeting, Tuesday 17th of November, to, and welcome to everyone to making it suddenly a very packed room. Um, one of the joys of being a deputy chair on any committee is the knowledge that at some point you may be in this chair and today is that day for me, just as well there's nothing controversial on the agenda. Um, because there's so many new people in the room, I'm just going to very briefly run through some of the housekeeping. Uh, toilets, for those who don't know, just through this door here. Um, fire evacuation procedures, just leave the building via the stairs and assemble in front of the Civic Centre. If not able to exit this way, then exit via the corridor behind the Ed Edinburgh Room and through the Glenmorey Auditorium to assemble in Harrop Street. If not able to exit via e either of these routes, follow staff who will take everyone across the air bridge, which will be great fun, to the Civic Centre. Earthquake procedures, and I have been in here when there has been one. Uh, please remain in the building, it's much safer. Move away from the windows and any equipment and furniture which may topple. Take uh, shelter under these very robust tables and hold on. In all cases, please turn off your phones as well, whatever that was. In all cases, follow instructions given by fire wardens, civil defence officers and emergency services. Um, Councillors, you'll be aware we've got a very busy schedule today and I think um, I was in being included in forgetting we've actually got a council meeting after this as well. So, um, as you know, we've got three speakers in the public forum, so we shall move straight on to that. And we welcome Mary O'Brien and Chris Ford. Yep, please, just come up here. Welcome. Um, Chris, I know you've been here before. Mary, have you been? Been here before, you know the rules, just five, five minutes is yours, thereafter we'll, we'll ask you questions. Right, where away. It's off. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here, uh, Mr Chairman, the Mayor and the Deputy Mayor. My name is Mary O'Brien and I'm the Access Coordinator for CCS Disability Action. As most of you know, we advocate for improved access for disabled people to the community, but we also strongly emphasise that good access is beneficial to the whole community on the whole, so that's pretty important. Um, Right, let's see. Ooh, can you just, okay, which one? That one, there we are. Can you just flick it down for me, please? Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. So we advocate that the council include as many people as possible in George Street following the upgrade. And it's well established now that poor street design excludes people from the community, not just disabled people, but young families with children and prams, the elderly. And that actually has quite a significant effect. For the people who can't get in, it stops them accessing economic opportunities and goods and services. And for the people who have businesses, they are losing a lot of customers. Around 25% of the New Zealand population has a disability. Now, not all of those people won't be able to get into town, but it's a fair proportion. So, for, for that reason, we support the one-way the one -way street. We support no curbs. Um, they're very difficult for to people to no, navigate. Um, one of the services that we offer is an accessible street audit and we do those mostly in the North Island, but one of the key things that comes up there is curbs, steep curbs, difficult curbs, people just can't get over them. And also, if you're going to have a street party or something like that, they're the things that um, people are going to fall over. We support maximum flexibility. You've got to be able to do anything in George Street if you want, so that again, that flat service is employment. Um, we support the reduced way, uh, lane width. Now that's important for crossing, and it's not just 
getting across the road, for many people it's the time and the energy that it takes to cross. So if you've got a narrow lane width, then that's much easier for people to cross. We, um, overall, we advocate that the council make George Street safer. We know that um, George Street in Dunedin has a very poor um, pedestrian injury and mortality rate that will contribute to that dropping. We think that the electric bus is essential and we also believe that if George Street is safe and the traffic's at a reasonable speed and those sorts of things, if it was one way it would be fine. People who are able to get into town and around the street would be able to cross. Um, we think you need to make the maximum space for amenities and placemaking. And the other really important thing about these making George Street accessible, etc., is it will then fit with the um, government policy statement on land transport. Some of the key goals in this statement are accessibility and safety. They're right up the top. The national view is slowly starting to change. So we need to fit in with that. The other thing that's really important that's being reviewed at the moment um, are the NZTA guidelines for pedestrian planning, and that's for designing for engineers and things like that. And that too, we are hoping it'll be um, released soon, will be focused more on accessibility. We do not support the two-way in any way, shape or form. The kerbs are a major access barrier. There's no flexibility. Um, I think that we'll just, if you just carry on the way that is, we'll carry on with our high rate of um, pedestrian deaths and injuries, which isn't acceptable. We need to have the electric bus. I think it's really important that you investigate the effectiveness of two-way shared spaces that have high traffic flows. It's our information that if you have a two-way shared space with high traffic flows, that it's not so successful. However, if it wasn't a thoroughfare, then it may well be different. Um, we think the two-way provides limited placemaking and amenity. It's really just George Street with a new surface. Um, and again, it will conflict with what the government's documents are. So just to finish off, um, we urge the council to think about making a destination, not a thoroughfare. We strongly urge the council to consider the original community consultation that was carried out. We were heavily involved in that. There was a huge diversity of participation. Um, we attended some of the first meetings and we started with a blank page and discussed about what the community wanted. I think it would be very, very sad if the council um, left that behind. The other thing you need to be thinking about is um, the increased demands for George Street as the population ages. So elderly people really need to be able to get out and around because it's going to place a huge burden on the imbalance of people who are younger. So we think you need to not have a two-way George Street and make it fully accessible to make Dunedin a great small city. Thank you. Th thank you, Mary. That's uh, excellent. I presume you're um, obviously happy to take questions? Yes, thank you. Yep. And can I just urge councillors, this is question time, and I will not be too tolerant of letting people trail into opinion. We'll have plenty of time to do that later when we get to item 11. Mm -hmm. um, Councillor Hula. Thank you. Are you aware that in the um, proposal for the two-way, it's the, the proposal at the moment is with no curbs and it's flat. Are you aware of that? In the original one that we saw at the consolation, it said curbs with The curbs. one that we're looking at today right. is, is flat. Yeah. It would still put a different light on it, but I still think um, traditionally the marking on two-way um, shared spaces and the actual traffic volume it's about the perception of being safe, isn't it, Chris? Mm, Which is really important. And if people don't feel safe, they just won't go out. Mm. Yeah. Um, two more questions. Were you members of the advisory group? Did you go along to... Were you on that or go to any of the meetings? Which one? The Central City Advisory Group. 
um, I've been to one meeting. We and I've been to all three. Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. brilliant. Mm. Oh, that's great, Chris. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. good. Um, also, do you realise that the two-way means that the loop bus can go up and down? Without it, it can only go, you know, it goes the one way down George Street. Yeah, we've got some reservations about that, and I really think that's something that the council needs to investigate. As I said, if it was safe, I believe people would cross to use it. Yeah, I think that you want to make that decision on um, a bit more information. Yeah. So how would it turn around? It would what, go around the block mean? or something, yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Thank you. Councillor Barker. Hello, Mary and Chris. Hello. I have a question around the um, Centre City <laughs> Advisory Group and the survey that we've been given in our papers. And I have you read the papers that we are talking about today? We've had a very I've had a very cursory mm. look. Yeah. It? yeah. So there's yes, a, there's a survey in there, and it says that there were 17 respondents to the survey, and I see there's 35 members on the um, advisory group. And I wonder if you saw the it was a questionnaire that Cobus meant sent out. I wonder if a you saw the questionnaire, and b if you actually responded to the questionnaire, given that only 50 percent appear to. Have. Oh yeah, absolutely. We put in um, quite a detailed submission to that. So, so both of you got the opportunity to do yes, that? thank you. Oh, that's yeah. great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Lord. Yeah, I just had a question just when you were asking for no curbs, and I'm just wondering, are you meaning drop-off curbs or because I'm just thinking about the drainage effect. How, how do you stop a flash flood sending stormwater into shops and that? So are you supportive of a raised but just a nice soft-flowing curb or...? No, um, just just totally flat, Did and that, that works effectively. If you've got a clever engineer, they can do that um, very easily, and they're effective in a lot of places. Um, if the the place outside Selwyn College in Castle Street, that's totally flat, a shared space, most of it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It, and it just means you know people can go, but you need signals and differentiations like differences in the paving or those sorts of things for people yeah. Yeah. so there's a whole science and art to it yeah councillor elder Just, thanks, thanks, Chair. Just a question around the bus hub because I've had quite a bit of feedback from older people and people with um, disabilities or mobility issues around the bus hub being too far from George Street. Can you comment on that, the distance for people to go from the bus hub? We do get a lot of feedback from people who find it difficult to get from the bus hub through to George Street or down to the hospital. And we think something like the circular bus would really help that. Mm. Do you want to comment on that, Chris? I think that that would really assist. Yes, mm. yeah. Um, we would support any move like that to make it easier for people. Oh, oh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Mr Chair. Chris Mary. Um, you made a comment about if it remains a thoroughfare and the traffic volumes remain high, you don't think you'll get the pedestrian outcomes that, or placemaking outcomes that would like to be achieved. Could you just elaborate on that a little bit in terms of how do you mean what you believe would happen there? We believe it would just be just the same old George Street. You need some space and attractions. If I think of other open spaces and spaces that we go to in other cities, not only do I think about the some that we go to quite regularly, um, we'll go there and we'll do this and we'll do that, but I think about the attractions that we will enjoy, and sometimes we go for the attractions, that's the reason, and then you end up um, spending some money. I think it's really worthwhile for the council to note too that um, the little towns that are surrounding Dunedin, some in the Clutha district and in central Otago, they're moving towards pedestrian nice spaces and shared spaces. So, you know, it needs, Dunedin needs to keep up with that. Yeah. 
Councillor Gary. Yeah. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, Ms O'Brien and Mr Ford, I'd be interested in your comments on the following two things. I just want to clarify around your preference about the bus, the loop bus we call it. Um, is, am I right in assuming your preference is for a loop bus that just continues in one direction going around? Is, is that correct? That, hmm. mm. that would work. Um, and secondly, could you describe the challenges of um, somebody with a disability, particularly mobility disability, getting out of a car on a street where there's a curb versus on a flat area? Um, because many of us around the table wouldn't have had that experience firsthand. Yes, that's, that's, a, very, you, that's a very good question, Councillor Gary. Tarakoto Katoa, councillors, I just wish to state that I'm here in support of Gary, but in relation to the question that was posed, I would say that the exper my experience is more informed by two things. One, I'm a mobility taxi user in the main, and so therefore get out of mobility taxis via hoist lifts or a little mini ramp on some of the newer vehicles in particular. So when I exit, I prefer to exit onto a flat space. There are not many, very many safe spaces around town where you can actually do that and keep safe, really. It's a, a very, very difficult problem, particularly around the George Street area, uh, I find, and it's therefore quite important that I can exit onto a flat terrain, onto flat space, and then be able to navigate my way around easily. I would provide it a lot better in a more pedestrianised space, where there are drop-off zones for mobility vans, courier vans, etc. And that those spaces are, ident are identified clearly and are fairly spaced throughout the CBD, so as to enable people like myself and also mobility card holders to park in certain areas as well and have those dedicated parks too. So I think it's quite important that so A, smooth terrain and B, a lighting and a safe space is quite important. They are quite important considerations. Mm. My final question, if I may, Chair, uh, is around the contribution of um, the disability community to our economy, is there something called a purple dollar? Am I right on that? And, and so yes. I'm really wanting to know, you know, um, in terms of tangible contribution to our economy, can you speak to that, please, Mr. Ford or Ms. O'Reilly? Yes, it has been estimated that the, there is a considerable contribution that can be made by disabled people to the overall economy. A study was done by, I think it was an economics consultancy, I can't remember whom, I'm sorry, for the Access Alliance, which is campaigning for accessibility laws, improved accessibility laws in Aotearoa, which hopefully should come before Parliament next year. Anyway, what that report said is that if you remove access barriers, that is physical access barriers as well as barriers in the built environment, in the streets and the buildings around us, then that will create something in the order of an additional $3 billion. I can't remember the exact figure, don't quote me on it, but it would be around that figure that would be added to our GDP if disabled people were able to participate more within the economy as A, consumers, customers, users of services and buyers of goods, and as well as that, B, as employees, because one of the barriers to employment for disabled people is being able to work from accessible spaces, and not many workplaces are accessible, but one of the things, and this is just a little aside, of course, is that given that since COVID, more people are working from home, that has provided a bit of a boon for disabled people, but yet, nonetheless, being able to be in, a, in the same workplace is quite considerable. But coming back to George Street and to that, to that figure, I think it's quite important that we are consumers and also we are potential employees of those same sorts of places. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Lofiso. 
tēnā koe, Mr Chairperson. Tēnā kōrua, Ms O'Brien and Mr Ford. Um, thank you very much for um, all the energy that you've put into this process so far and, and coming along today. Um, what message, should the council today choose the two-way option, what message do you believe that would send to your community um, in terms of access and inclusion and power? Well, it would send a message that we that we have sort of lesser importance. We there are far more people who mobilise for walking, cycling, wheeling as I do, and using other micro devices than perhaps there are car users. And that that is that trend will continue into the future as our environmental crises continue to dictate that more people should use public transport, should use other modes such as walking, in my case wheeling and cycling to get around. And so therefore what the message that that would send to our community as well is that, and to older people too in our community, the incidences I've recounted numerous times to numerous council meetings is that Older people have a greater incidence of disability. Therefore, with an ageing population of my parents, even though they live in Australia, I'm one of the generation of Generation X who were from baby boomer parents. So I just think of them, I think of all the other older people I know and ageing people who we all know, we should all have bear that in mind today, that we, and you should all bear that in mind as councillors, that you will know people who are disabled, know people who are older, who you are, your parents, grandparents, who are members of your Fano extended family, friends, neighbours. You need to send a message to them that they are as valuable and as important participants in our society for enabling them to come to into their city centre as well because I've heard representations from the likes of Grey Power and Age Concern who have said that many older people are deterred from going to the centre city just due to the fact that they feel unsafe. So if we improve the environment for them, we improve the environment for everybody. And uh, Councillor Raddick. Thank you, and thanks for your presentation. Um, so, just in that last uh, sentence, you said that you know a lot of people are dissuaded from going to the city centre, both disabled people and elderly people, because they feel unsafe. What are the factors that make it that make you feel unsafe, or make those people mentioned feel unsafe? Mm. I guess what has been discussed in the Central City Advisory Group and others for us, for us, sorry, is the, around the fact of just being safe, physically safe. Uh, for example, I just feel if I go up the street on a Saturday night, I'm just feeling a tad insecure within myself because I think that, for example, with better lighting, better street lighting, better amenities available, more sit-down places and so forth, would enable people just generally to feel a greater sense of physical safety and a sense of security. Uh, and I think that that point has been made by the police, amongst others, in the, uh, in the area of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So I think that really that it's about having a CBD that's also not only physically safe, it's safe in terms of the infrastructure that I don't get injured, but also making sure that I too can enjoy the CBD with, with a sense of personal security as well. So um, when you say physical, uh, the infrastructure, so you don't get physically injured, that's are you right. specifically re to referring to curbs and unevenness of yes. the surface. Because right now, when I go down George Street, I, uh, uh, as a wheelchair user, I can feel the vibration of the cobbles yes. underneath me, and that's rather uncomfortable. <laughs> and so for me as a wheelchair user, that is something that can be taken away through having a better surface 
Mm. And one that's ultimately safe as well yes, for everybody sir. too. Mm. Sorry, did you have something to add to that, Mary? Yes. There's a considerable um, evidence base now being developed around disability and access and particularly to the transport system and often what is shown in that that disabled people make less trips so you decide not to go more often. Quite often that means they'll either make less trips or they don't make the trip at all, they just don't go. And a lot of that's for safety reasons. Sometimes it's an economic reason. That's right. Otherwise, they will make a shorter trip or they are forced to take a longer, more taxing trip. For example, when we had our office in Great King Street, further up there, um, past the museum and the Caltex, one of our colleagues was a wheelchair user. If she wanted to go to town, she wouldn't come out and turn right and go down the street because the cross wall in Great King Street is so steep that it stops you from wheeling. It creates shoulder injuries and things like that in wheelchair users in the long term. And sometimes when it's really steep, frail people just fall. That's right. Yeah. It's, it's the camber that is a real mm -hmm. issue as it builds up over time on yes. road surfaces. Mr Chairman, I'd like to move that we extend the length of public forum beyond half an hour. Yes. Thank you. Yes. So, uh, are you aware that the two-way shared path proposal that we're looking at today is quite a change from the previous, or the current, curbed street, and is in fact a smooth uh, transition right across from shop front to shop front, right across George Street. So, uh, would that allay your fears of physical infrastructure? Well, it would allay many of our fears, but I think still, as we come back to, and the one way street option is our preferred option, yes. and in that sense, with um, appropriate supporting infrastructure and services, such as a bus loop that just goes around in a circular motion, so, so yes, that would be our preference. So I, I guess that councillors need to weigh that those sorts of things up. And, yeah. and, and may I just say too that just in terms of process, if I may point out, Mr Chair, we only received the bulk of the information about today's meeting and as the other, did other members of the Central City Advisory Group only this morning. And therefore, I didn't have a lot of time to read through a lot of the material that would have given me a better idea as to what was being proposed. So there is that need for process to, for the process rather of information dissemination distribution to be improved next time these sorts of issues are discussed because they're very important. However, we are assured by the fact that there will be further ongoing discussions, but we do know that there is a need to come to a decision at some point, obviously. Yes. Uh, Councillor Reddick, do you have further questions that, that, that are not staying on similar topic? Yes. Okay. Um, the, uh, so further to the... Um, you know, the proposal, uh, currently the, the George Street situation is about 40% pedestrianisation focused, pedestrian, pedestrian focused, and the two-way shared street takes it to 65%, which is quite a change uh, compared to any curbed proposition. And of course, there is the plan to put uh, amenity... Leading to a question? Yes, indeed. Uh, so were you aware of that and the, the comparison with the one-way shared path. Yes, and we also noticed um, in the information that we got at the previous meeting that if you had a one-way um, pedestrianised street, there would be 75% yes. um, pedestrianisation. That's and right. I think it's really important for business people and councillors to understand that pedestrians spend more. That's People right. wander along the street and spend their money. Mm. And if you look at some of the um, other areas in the country, they've had massive increases in spending, and it's from increased pedestrianisation and from people feeling safer. Mm, yeah. Thank you. Can't uh, overemphasise that enough. Yes. Mm. Um, 
And the last thing about the, the loop bus, because if the loop bus only goes in one direction and has a, a reasonably large, you know, reasonably comprehensive route to get around, then it's a long wait to get back to where, if you disembark and then move along the street, it's quite a long wait, you know, quite a, a number of minutes to get all the way around the circuit back to where you started if you want to get back to where you started. Whereas if there's a double loop bus in both directions, as is typically the case in uh, Point of order, Mr. Chair. jurisdictions, <laughs> yeah. are you aware of that uh, difference? Councillor, again, is this leading to a question? We've got a very, we've got a large public forum here and I, get, I suspect some of these questions are going to be raised with the next two submitters. So well, it would be good just right. to get to a question. Certainly, but it's only fair to ask these submitters this question. So are you aware of the, the difference in convenience that that would make for you know, people in wheelchairs because the loop bus has very wide doors, easy to get in and out and low because of the flat surface? Um, as Chris said, we just received the, the information about that and to comment on that we would need a lot more evidence but just from thinking where we are now, traffic going two ways, I would say there is a much greater risk of getting run over by that's a car. Right. That's the big thing that stops people going out. Also, if it's one way, it creates the whole different ambience in the area, and people can gently cross the road, walk across. If you, There'll be people who can't cross the road, but they probably don't get to town that often easier. But we want to make everything easier for everybody. So again, we wouldn't see any advantage. We don't um, haven't seen any studies or information about the pros and cons of a one-way or two-way system with regarding to the loop bus. However, you could have more than one bus if that was the issue. If you're going to have two buses going two ways, why can't you have two going the same way? Yeah, no, most certainly. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor okay. Wiley. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, Ms O'Brien and Mr Ford, I have a feeling safety is one of your key parameters, is probably the key parameter that I've heard today. Are you disappointed that we didn't have an option here to fully pedestrianise George Street? I would say, say yes. I think that that would be one of the options that should be taken back and put on the table. I have to, uh, and for wider public consultation and discussion. It will, and this process, uh, as it has already, has engendered quite a wide range of discussion, but from our standpoint, a fully pedestrianised option should be also placed back again on the table. Yep. Thank you. Yes, we are concerned about safety, but safety is not just a concern for disabled people, which is higher yes. on their list. Um, an examination of New Zealand ACC data showed that about 700 people a year are admitted to hospital through slips, trips and falls, and it's mainly going up and down curbs. We do not have a lot of valid and useful information about pedestrian injuries and accidents for the simple reason that um, data is collected for transport and um, it's about cars. And if there is an injury or incident that um, involves a pedestrian, the police options when they tick the boxes are likely to be around. Um, to be honest, they blame the pedestrian, didn't take care, was wearing a black coat, wasn't looking, those sorts of things. So we've got very little information, but we've got a lot of um, feedback that about that. And another piece of data that's coming out about footpath safety um, from research has been completed in, in Christchurch is that when younger, older people fall, they stop going out. They yeah. stop walking, they stop exercising, and those sorts of things. Okay, and, and yeah. but we've, we've already, I guess, had the discussion or made the point that there, under in either proposal that we've got in our front, there will be no curb and channeling in the design. So, I, but we totally appreciate those comments. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, the, you can certainly uh, talk about um, safety and I get the feeling that speed of movement of flow of traffic or any movement up and down George Street yes. is an issue. Yes. Um, and so you think even at 30 k's or even less would be a, um, even one way or two way, yeah. Oh. 
A part of, of, of the shared spaces and, and streets and things like that is the way that it's set up and the varying ways that um, drivers are given signals around speed and some of it's around signage. There's other cues about the number of people that are moving around and things like that. And I do think it will be more difficult for drivers and pedestrians to read that when it's a two-way two -way street. Um, from my colleagues who have been involved uh, across our organisation and transport engineers and other people that we um, often meet with, it's quite a science in, in getting your shared space right, but there's so many benefits to everybody, it's not just to a few people. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. And um, I, I look at the report that we've gotten and I'm disappointed that you haven't had a chance to read it until this morning. but. Um, Mr. Mentz commented that it may be more appropriate to retain a two-way traffic through the period of the hospital rebuild to provide more flexibility to deal with the traffic effects of that project. Yeah. So I'm, I'm getting your thoughts on how this would work all around the city, even through the period of the hospital build. Yes, I read that, but it's very, it's too early to make any sort of judgments on that, we'd need to take it back to our relevant membership and so forth, and to the disability community to discuss their views on this. But there might be some plausibility to that, but perhaps also you might like to look at, if that is the case, traffic management plans that would take into account a one-way pedestrianisation option for the CBD, two-way, fully pedestrianised, as well as the current two-way system. So looking at the, having those sorts of options put before council as well, as, as it comes to make its decision, and also before the community, so that we know what the traffic management issues might be around that because we need more information about that, obviously. Thank you. Um, I've just um, nodded at a couple of people wanting to ask questions and given them a scowl. I'm going to allow two more questions unless I could be convinced that the question you're going to give me does not keep us going around in circles. So, Councillor Huan. Thank you. Um, can I just ask, do you realise, because you might not have seen it, as you're saying, you haven't seen the papers that early, that um, in the proposal we've got, it has the option, if it was two-way, that it has the flexibility to be shut off, you know, for events or things like that, or um, how do you feel about that? Um, I don't think, we don't, we don't support that, because okay. it's about people having a normal, ordinary life, going to town, doing their shopping, going for a coffee, all of those things. And some of you may find that difficult to believe, but that's the reality for a lot of people. And that's what we're trying to avoid. And as our um, population ages, we're going to have a lot of trouble with people who are shut in. And some that's of, right. Yeah. Uh, are you aware that the majority of the people who responded to the Central City Advisory Group were in favour of the two-way? <coughs> No, and I would also um, answer that question by saying that was a very small sample. There are a small number of respondents, yes. and that really is not enough information for anybody to make a decision on. Okay. Plus, um, I would also greatly urge you all to go back and look at the enormous wealth of work that the Council yes. put into mm. the previous consultation. That's right. It shouldn't yeah. all be discarded. I think also, too, just remembering about the time period for that survey, and I am mindful of the time, but I will just say very quickly that essentially that time frame was too constrained, perhaps for some people and organisations to get back to council as well. So I think that perhaps a more robust survey needs to be run mm. that would come up with a far more definitive result as part of the next round of consultation. It sounds like you'd prefer that we maybe even put this on hold and decide it at another date once there was more information, is that what you're saying? Well, yes, sir, but at the same time I do realise that the Council needs to mm. come to a final decision on this as well. But I think that 
the, the overall that we're pleased that we've been given the afforded the opportunity to be heard today. Mm -hmm. We are. Yes. yes. Thank you. People with uh, disabilities do have to get around in the car, point, though. Point of, order, Mr. Question. point of order, Mr. Chairman. Uh, per standing orders, the function of the public forum is to ask questions of clarification of the presentation. We're going to be here all day if members insist on asking questions yeah. paragraph by paragraph of Absolutely. agenda item 11. Yeah. I uphold that. Um, thank you. And final question, Councillor Lefiso. Kia ora, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question has already been answered. Thank you. Uh, Mary and Chris, thank you very much for your um, very passionate and articulate presentation. And uh, Chris, just be aware there's nothing wrong with Gen X. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. <laughs> Mr. Campbell, you're obviously cognizant of the process here. I think you've probably had 40 minutes to work it out. Five minutes to speak and questions. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, five minutes, five minutes is yours. Um, firstly, I'd like to say hello, everyone. Good to see you again. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I did have some slight context that I wanted to bring forward, but seeing how um, the last presentation went, I'll try to fly through some of the things that I think still appear to be common knowledge. Um, so first off, I'm submitting on behalf of Generation Zero and requesting that the Council does not support the pro proposal for the two-way street design and the business case study. Um, but instead that the Council supports the design options, um, uh, option two, favouring the one-way shared space and a slight preference between northbound and southbound traffic, I think south. Bound actually sounds pretty nice. Um, I'm supporting an uh, increase in the scope of the project, also connect it to the octagon as recommended. Um, I think I'm able to reach this conclusion kind of reading the Cobus Mens report. It seems like uh, analyzing the pros and cons that were put forward and the values that the city has around climate change and accessibility, that uh, the one way design is naturally favored by a, a fair reading of, of the report itself. Um, firstly, Generation Zero uh, believes that it is important to put people first in the designing of our city streets and that uh, this, we also believe um, that the street design must meet the needs of people walking, cycling, taking transit, doing business, providing city, providing city services and driving all in a constrained space. I think we can, I can appreciate that this topic has been well, very well covered by the previous issue and they will definitely talk to it far better than I ever will. Um, Secondly, I believe that this council um, needs to take its um, um, stance on climate change pretty seriously. Um, we are world leaders, um, that is in car usage. Um, we're third place behind Monaco and Liechtenstein, and fourth place is the United States of America, which we all like to laugh at. Um, and so I th in thinking about how we approach city design um, in the 21st century, we need to actually have a plan to ensure that the designs that we put forward form a piece of the puzzle which actually is designed right and in a way that will reduce car usage in this city. And this is why I'm asking you to support the one-way design over, over the two-way design. Um, car, car transport and planning has definitely been orientated towards the infrastructure of the private motor vehicle. And as car usage has grown and land use planning has supported, we have now have in Dunedin a great urban sprawl. And the consequences of that urban sprawl is that there is more vehicles in the central city area there is cause, that causes congestion and requires an increased amount of land to be dedicated to car parking. This focus on the private motor vehicle has been at the expense of investing in facilities which create safe, convenient and attractive experiences for other modes of transport like public transport and cycling. It has also negated the, negatively impacted the provision of an attractive, high quality, healthy and safe environment for pedestrians. Today's central city is one of the poorest safety records for pedestrians and cyclists in the country. Also, car-dominated city centres do not have positive benefits for the entire retail sector. Whilst parking outside destination retailers may be convenient, uh, it reduces the amount of incidental spending and interaction in cars by walking past m multiple retailers. 
Um, so just to clarify, when I was reading as much as I could about this report, um, there were nine key principles of, of the dis this design. And on assessing the two-way option and the one-way option as best as I could, the one-way, uh, the two-way option met five of the nine principles, and the two, uh, the one-way option met seven of the nine principles. Furthermore, the revised assessment put forward by Cobus Minch scored the one-way design south as the highest possible score of of all the options put forward. It is uh, publicly favourable, and as far as the um, metrics put forward for safety, opportunities of place making, cycling and micromobility, overall network function, retail accessibility, ability to provide public transport, uh, crime prevention through environmental design, flexibility of the design for future needs and public acceptability. So if you're checking over with me, I'm on page 70 now um, of the agenda. Um, and so I think there's um, some things worthy of considering here that I'll try to get through very quickly. So it says that the, the two-way option will have a streetscape that will allow George Street to um, vulnerable users to access George Street more easily. I think that is obviously a sensible thing that you could claim because of the reduction of curbs. However, it also says more space is allocated um, to vehicle movement, providing less opportunity to create people-focused spaces, as well as less favorability for cycling and micromobility than the one-way option options and it reduces the ability to improve safety in the five-way uh, intersection which re reduces our opportunity for funding assistance rates from the NZTA. So I mean on the balance of things apparently the streetscape is uh, better for more vulnerable people but it also is not. Um, it also increases vehicle through movement, may support retail passing by car. I would like to see evidence for car transport and if any of the councillors who have been doing lots of consultations of this could provide me with some evidence I would like to see it. And uh, it meets the crime prevention through environmental design objectives, which I don't think is true. Crime prevention through environmental design um, is said to be um, good in uh, that this council or this uh, uh, report has said that basically crime prevention through environmental design exists solely through cars driving past the street. That is how they've designated crime prevention through environmental design, when the other features that if you go on Wikipedia about crime prevention for environmental design, increased pedestrianisation, increased cycling, increased visual amenity, and better lighting and access are the main points towards uh, crime prevention through environmental design. Tim, can you wrap up in 30? I'll go very fast. Thank you. Oh, you know, time is time, right, Carmen? All right, more space. But whereas in the one-way option, the, the advantages, which is includes a safer than the two-way option, greater opportunity to create public amenity, greater provision for cycling and micromobility, and addresses the safety of issues of the one-way street, which are considered advantages, are also in that same uh, page saying that there's less potential for crime prevention through environmental design because there's reduced traffic. So as far as I'm concerned, this report is definitely contradicting itself about some of the claims about crime prevention and the ability to put traffic through the space. Not only that, um, I th I, yeah, this is it. Uh, this is why I think that the one-way design is actually the most favorable design as the report describes it. When you look at the options for the report, it is more favorable and that is it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Campbell, for that sort of concise presentation. No, no, absolutely um, not. Um, <laughs> questions? Councillor Hula. Thank you. Are you aware of um, Professor Nathan Berg's research where he mentioned that if the traffic is blocked to one lane or congested in any way, which of course this would be with the hospital rebuild and then if we went to one lane in George Street at the same time that we'd get congestion of traffic, that it would cause more carbon emissions. Are you aware of that? I mean, yeah, but we already have like a congestion problem, like make, it is already about at peak. So if it's, if it's worse, it's because we're already at capacity and we should be looking to reduce that capacity so it is not so bad. But Generation Zero want to help the climate, isn't it? Sorry, is that a question? Is it We're at question yes, it's a time. question. It's a question. Is it an, not an issue for you that our carbon emissions could increase? Uh, I'm quite aware of how carbon emissions increase through production, and unfortunately, if you guys keep on waiting, you're going to have to invest more on my behalf, and that means you will be creating the carbon emissions that mean that I have to deal with it. So I appreciate, I appreciate that. It's a very important question, that when you develop carbon solutions, emissions go up. That is uncontested fact. Thanks, Finn. Also, just to clarify, um, I think it's brilliant that we've had people come and talk to us today, yeah. but 
in, to put it in perspective, these are Generation Zero and the disability community, and we've got people from students. Mm. It's a small proportion of the group, the larger group that were represented at the Central City Advisory, because each do, one again, of those, do I have to yes, keep I have a question. the question? Can we get to the Steve, questions? I have a question, well, Councillor. We don't Walker. have to go through twenty sentences to get to a question. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Um, as my question is that do you think it's fair of today, we said, okay, we disagree with the majority of the people in that central city advisory group can, can because it, we've heard from small groups. Point of order, oh. point of order. Um, the membership of the group that um, filled out the questionnaire is anonymised, so therefore you cannot tell the makeup of that group. So therefore for the councillor to be making a statement about the makeup of that group, has no factual basis that the councillors could be aware of because the makeup is anonymised. Therefore, you, the, the 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 people who filled out the questionnaire, you don't know which members of the CCAG filled that questionnaire out. And what if that questionnaire was filled but out by a whole heap of people order. from one concept? So I guess my point is, I feel I feel that the councillor is bringing up facts which are not substantiated. And therefore, and also is not asking a question to the presentation, is in fact heading off to make a point rather than to ask a question. Uh, um, oh. Excuse me, I'm running on a point of order. I'm, I'm going to uphold that. And as the, as the Mayor pointed out earlier, can we stick to questions related to the paper in front of us? And if you're able. Um, excuse me, um, the councillor just swore at me. Can the councillor just swore at me, Mr. Chair. Can you please withdraw that and apologise? I withdraw and apologise. Thank you. Councillor Fiso. Tēnā koe, Mr. Chairman. Tēnā koe, Mr. Campbell. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to uh, Gen Zero for your ongoing commitment and mahi in this space. Um, and I would just like to ask the similar message, uh, the question that I asked um, Ms O'Brien and Mr Ford, what message would be sent um, to young people, uh, to the young people that you mahi with, uh, that are part of your community if we, if we chose the two-way? The two-way two design. Um, well, I just think that Every conversation I've basically had building up to this meeting right now has just been consulting consulting with my peers and the general consensus is, oh God, they're going back to the two-way design. Could we please have some thinking that actually factors us into it because we're going to be the people who actually use this space in a couple more years' time. One final question. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr Chair. Um, so how would you how would you counteract um, claims or assertions that you are anti-car and and your opinions are dismissed because you don't own cars? Um, yeah, I don't I don't mind being anti-car when we have a car problem. Uh, I'm anti-car when we have 90 95% of our passenger trips are made up of the car and that we're world record holders basically. That is that is where I'm like, okay, there is a there is a there is a reasonable amount that you could fit a car in, into a space and when those cars um, start filling up the entire space it turns out it doesn't work for anyone and I think, you know, this is just important to think about, you know, making sure that we're having that climate change conversation about we need to be reducing that number of cars entirely. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Campbell. I asked this question before of the um, other presenters around the CCAG, the Centre City Advisory Group, and mm. I note that less than 50% of the CCAG filled in the survey, and I hope that you saw that there was a survey um, in the papers that we have been given, mm -hmm. I see that the name Jenny Cotham was down there as the person that was attending the um, advisory group. Did you get the opportunity to attend the advisory group or not? Um, I, I've been, um, for most of this year, working during the day, so I've been able to attend regular mm -hmm. meetings like that. So. Okay. So did you get the opportunity to fill out the, um, the questionnaire? Uh, not me personally, but I trust that if Jenny was there, she would have probably filled it out. Well, 50, over fifty percent didn't fill it out. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'm just trying to understand. Uh, obviously, the data was anonymised, but trying to understand mm. who got the opportunity and who did fill it out. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 
Councillor Lord. Ethan, uh, probably a question I should have asked Chris Ford, but he, he um, right. referred to the effects of cobblestones and that sort of thing being not <coughs> particularly user-friendly for wheelchair yeah. users. And I'm just wondering, do you have a, a comment, or do you know if there's products available in terms of, um, he referred to larger slabs, but are you confident that we can do this sort of work in a user-friendly way that will take away not... I mean, solve his problem without providing a problem for the rest of us in terms of non-slip. Yeah. Are you familiar um, with the products? No, that's right. I mean, I just also thinking about when you were talking about the curbs earlier with uh, Chris and you were trying to figure out that, I was just saying, um, to answer, I suppose, there was a, you V the road in, into the middle where the drainage actually runs down the centre of the road, not in the curbs at the side. As far as, far as the technology goes for those papers, yeah, I think that they're... Um, the way to have a, a, a well sign posted um, but still flat space is to have the, the flat pavers that I'm confident that do exist, but also using uh, tactile pavers as a way of wayfinding. So if you um, have a visual impairment, you can use your stick to follow the line down, down the path. So I think there are options to have some slightly raised and some flattened um, uh, stones that can also help people actually literally read the street, and I think uh, I think they're good. I think they should definitely be investigated. So, sorry, I was just I was just meaning particularly in terms of non-slip, and I just think I don't know if yeah. you've ever been to the Gold Coast, but I know sometimes you walk oh. down the street and surface paradise with jandals on, and suddenly you. Uh, it is right, yeah. You can, get a, you can get a heck of a fright <laughs> yeah. in your back jars and you think, whoa, so... I'm just yeah, no, that's all right. I mean, I, I would trust that, you know, um, council doesn't do the slipperiest of stones. I'd hope not. I, I, I think a good, nice, nice friction surface would be good. Thank you for the Jandals question, uh, Cam <laughs> Councillor Lord. Uh, Councillor Elder. Just, just going back to a question related to something Chris alluded to yeah. and yourself, okay. um, and that is about safety at night. Mm. Um, and recently I went down to pick up my student at about 8 o'clock and I was really alarmed at how few people were on the street. And when I thought about it, all the people were waiting for buses at the bus hub and not the street. And it, Mm. pulled the people away from the street and I hadn't realised it until I picked her up. Yeah. So what's, your, no, yeah. what's your comment about buses and their presence on the street and, and, and keeping, keeping the um, street populated, I suppose, mm. at night in particular? Uh, I mean, I think, uh, thank, thank you for that. I, I think, well, yeah, this is definitely one of the, the bigger issues that will be needed to be negotiated with, with this design, I think, is the improve, inclusion of buses. I think that the options for, like, the central city bus loop, I think, sound actually interesting. And don't, don't, don't strike me as immediately needing to go down George Street, but merely intersect with George Street as a way to uh, allow for drop off of passengers and pick off of passengers still near to George Street without necessarily taking too much of the amenity space away. And then I think uh, even in including within a one way design, I think it, there is actually space for having the, that just that wider bay area for that a bus can comfortably pull into and people can still hang around. And I think just thinking about, I think you alluded to uh, that nighttime space. I think part of the reason why that nighttime space is also uh, very dark. It's dark. There's not much. There's not much going on there, and there's not actually much reason to be there either. Like if I want to go down George Street and hang out, I think there is the odd park bench every good couple of meters. But as far as that, I'm I'm left out left out for dry with no no place to sit myself. So I think you know actually when we improve the visual amenity. Um, actually make put in some of those spaces that make people actually want to hang around in there, that would also be something that could you know, improve the quality and the safety that we're looking to improve. Thank you, Mr Campbell, for your time and coming along today. Much appreciated. No, thank you very much, everyone. I don't think I have to say you have five minutes. Oh. Yep, all good. All uh, yours. Tēnā tātou. Um, as Steve said, I'm here on behalf of OUSA. Um, and 
here as other members of OUSA with me. Um, I'm here to speak to you on behalf of um, OUSA and the 20,000 students that we represent. Um, and we were alerted to um, what we're speaking of today by a group of those 20,000 students who came to us quite um, alarmed about the U-turn that you're looking to make on this. Um, this, reserve, this reversal seems to be a reflection on a difference to a, a few vocal minority members of the community without regard for the consideration of Dunedin residents and pedestrians and other community groups like students who will be the majority of users of the upgraded Dunedin, uh, George Street precinct. Um, firstly, OUSA is concerned about the process which has been followed to reach this decision. In conducting this review, the DCC has included several differing criteria to the original consultation, and this is despite the fact that the original criteria we were well aligned with the Central City Plan and the Global Street Design Guide and the original community feedback that was received. Um, further, these criteria have been strongly influenced by cons consultation by the Central City Advisory Group, um, which has a limited membership. We acknowledge that OUSA was on this advisory group, and this gave us the opportunity to truly witness and understand the lack of diversity of the Dunedin community that was involved in that advisory group, which we think played a part in this U-turn and in the way that it was specifically influenced. Um, and secondly, OUSA is concerned that this revised design includes a decreased emphasis on pedestrianisation in favour of parking and an alternative bus service. In particular, we're concerned about the fact, um, the impact on safety, on the environment, and, and the, fu the future proofing of George Street. Um, as per our submission, OUSA notes that, that the traffic flow through of George Street does not necessarily increase public safety and may in fact reduce safety. Um, OUSA as a group, we're particularly interested in student safety and we would say with emphasis that George Street is a highly pedestrianised area that students go through, whether that's day to day, whether that's on the weekend, and we have many stories of student harassment which, student harassment, which we think is not going to be improved by continuing the way things are. Pedestrianisation does increase student safety, public safety. That's why we're supporting the one way primarily alongside the environmental points that we had in our submission. Um, this also goes against you know, many of the crime prevention um, through environmental design principles, which we pointed out in our submission. Um, and OUSA is concerned about the decision to rank the two-way path more highly for that crime prevention through environmental um, design principles given increased vehicular movement is not actually indicative of safer environments. Um, in terms of environmental impacts, a design that emphasises and ingrains car usage is undesirable. Um, New Zealand is one of the leading car users, as was previously discussed, and this is alongside Dunedin City being one of the large, largest emissions category in transport. And we think that this U-turn flies in the face of real progressive change that is really already happening across the country, as has been said. And Dunedin is falling behind and will continue to fall behind if you continue to push this sort of pedestrianisation further down the line. Um, the significant action on transport is required for the DCC to reach its 2030 zero carbon goal. And OUSA, we as a group, question the decision to adopt a design which further entrenches a car-based environment rather than transitioning away from it. And we believe adopting the two-way design does not align with the DCC's own goals and vision for the city, let alone OUSA's desired goals for the city. Um, OUSA also has concerns about the sudden emphasis on the electrified bus system, seemingly without any consultation with the wider community on the interest in or necessity of the service. While OUSA support increased bus access and the electrification of the Dunedin bus service, 
OUSA significantly prefers shifting the current service from George Street to Great King Street. And to better align with the existing bus hub, OUSA also questions the necessity and desirability of, second, of a second bus service running parallel to the existing bus system. And while we're highly supportive of electrification, it is not entirely clear why this needs to be a separate service rather than electrifying the existing one. Um, finally, OUSA understands that the original design adequately accounted for accessibility needs um, and parking in Centre City and the need for businesses to have access for deliveries. Um, the report that has been discussed notes that although there were disputes about the parking available at peak times, there was no evidence to support this. And therefore, we, don't, uh, we do not understand the need to completely review the design in order to increase these outcomes when they were already being achieved in the original design and at the expense of many other outcomes. And in conclusion, OUSA would like to reiterate our position that as per our submission, um, our support for a one-way street option. Um, we believe this option is likely to achieve the best outcome for residents of Dunedin including students, students who are a large voting block in this city, and we would like to remind you that OUSA is an organisation who is the primary organiser of voting drives on campus, that we keep track of who supports student initiatives, who supports environmental initiatives, and we keep track of those who do not. I can take your questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Waite Harvey. And congratulations on your appointment as president of OUSA. OUSA. Thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to go back to one of your very early points mm -hmm. about um, your commentary on traffic movement and safety, mm -hmm. plus or minus. Um, would it come as a surprise to you that um, people had anecdotally reported during the octagon closure that the absence of traffic actually increased the safety in that environment and reduced the number of harm events? Therefore, there was actually a negative correlation between safety and traffic movements, that cars did not bring safety. I mean, yes, I can yeah. give my own experience. Many students can give their own experience of their experience on specifically George Street. Um, cars do not provide safety. In fact, I can give examples of when cars actually made us feel unsafe um, because they're a way for people to harass you um, easily and drive away. Thank you. Councillor Barker. I just want to ask my question about mm -hmm. the um, Central City mm -hmm. Advisory Group. I see that on the advisory group it has Jack Manning's mm -hmm. name and I just wonder, um, I'm sort of concerned about the less than 50% that answered the questionnaire, and I just wonder if someone from OUSA got the opportunity to answer the questionnaire that was put out by Cobus Mintz. Yes, we did. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask your response to Ms O'Brien and Mr Ford's comment, uh, commentary about the bus loop mm -hmm. and the importance of that to people who uh, have difficulty um, with the distance to the bus hub and the difficulty getting around um, that particular sector of the population. What would be your response to that? Because I heard you yeah. say that you didn't think the bus loop, a separate bus loop was necessary. Did I mm -hmm. understand that correctly? Well, we don't see it as a priority per se for us as a group, um, but we are in favour of electrification. Um, the loop that they were discussing going through the one way, is that what you're talking yes, about? Yes, yes. Um, we haven't said that we would rule it out, but we haven't said it is a priority for so us. So it's not a priority for you. No. I guess I was asking your response to that being a priority for um, mm. the presentation we first heard. I mean, hard to discuss other groups, but I mean, if you look at our priority and their priority, our priority is safety. Um, that's why we support the one way. Their priority is the bus loop. So and I safety. don't see how those conflict. Um, Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Elder. Um, just following up from that, um, I know that Grey Power senior citizens and people with disability have in fact said that the bus hub is too far away for them to access the city well um, and international studies are on 
walkability from buses would confirm that um, because I looked at it for South Dunedin. So would you be happy with a bus loop, electrical bus loop for George Street given the accessibility issues related to that? Yeah, again, we haven't ruled out that we, we're not happy with the bus loop. It's not a priority for us, but we, we're not, we haven't said that we don't want it, um, so we're fine with the, the bus loop. And hopefully the bus loop, um, I know, I'm not aware of the, the route for the bus loop, but hopefully it goes past university as well. Yeah. Councillor Raddick. Yep, um, you canvassed quite a lot of uh, thoughts and ideas with your submission, but what, what is your prime objective for George Street? That is a one way. That's our primary. And why do you want it one way? We want it because it will increase safety, that it is the environmental option, um, and because it is what a majority of people wanted originally from a more diverse um, sample size of the community, which shows clearly that those in the community, those who are largely the pedestrians of the community, want this to happen. So we're following democracy and our own interests. Very good. Uh, so one of the things, one of the reasons for having a two-way shared path um, is for the uh, use of the, bu of the bus loop, that it would run in both directions, which would make it very convenient for uh, people to use that form of public transport. And the prime objective to achieve there would be to decar the street and make it really easy for people to access that street in two directions, being able to move easily. Mr Chairman, How it's five to three. Uh, if questions could be focused as questions of the presenters rather than annotated versions of the report and agenda item 11, I think we might get out of here this evening. Sorry, this has, yeah. been, this has been stated on numerous occasions, and as I've said, and I will uphold that, we will have plenty of time later on today, late into the night, to discuss this. And, and I've, I don't know how many times I've said this. Can we just keep questions specific and to the point? It doesn't need a 20-sentence lead-in. Well, this is a very important point because... Well, I was about to ask it, because having a one-way in the to favour, I suppose, accessibility just for pedestrians. To me, having that, well, how does the idea of the transport loop in both directions fit with that? We can both answer, because I have a thought on this. Um, frankly, I think the argument that a two-way transport is why a two-way needs to be favoured over a one-way is a bit of a cop-out. I think it's a way to hide the actual things that have gone behind this, which is the interests of retailers being prioritised over pedestrians. Pedestrians can use a one-way bus route. Pedestrianisation is what pedestrians want. A two-way is not what they want. We can work a bus route through a one-way. We don't need the two-way. Do you want to I was just going to say that we're, we're here to not stick to the status quo. We want to see an upgrade that's future-proofed, and part of that is working towards what we're seeing in other parts of the country, across other parts of the world, and that's a more environmentally friendly um, way of you know, modernising our streets. And so um, we're not here to argue about sticking with what's currently happening because that's what, not what we're in support of. So, okay, so I'm just going to remind you, I, I'm going to let you ask a question, but can I just remind you to ask questions related to the five-minute presentation that was just given? Sure. So what particular examples of these kinds of things are you uh, referring to across the world? You can look at any town in New Zealand. We don't have to look around the world. We can look right in New Zealand. We can look at any city. We've fallen behind. If you make this U-turn, we're going to continue to fall behind. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And finally, Councillor Wiley, and I'm sure you're cognizant of the, 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 the quality of questions we require. I always ask good quality questions. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, you mentioned about how you've got a strong student voice. Um, have you, and, and, and yet I'm struggling, you haven't articulated the size and how you've engaged. And the reason I asked this question is earlier in May, we received a petition from uh, two 
um, retailers in George Street with 6,000 names on it, submitting that George Street should retain two-way. Now, here we had evidence of an organisation like that presenting a powerful document. Yet, do you have any comment to make versus what you want to present to us? I mean, we didn't present a petition because we assumed that what happened earlier in the year and what was decided that it would be a one-way was going to happen. That's why we're here now, because what we thought would happen is now being reversed. Um, we can go get you a petition if you want. Um, thank, you, thank you very much, OUSA, for the presentation, and thank you today to all the, all the people who came to Public Forum. Um, I'm just going to move that we take a quick five minute adjournment. Seconded, uh, Mayor Hawkins. All those in favour?
Okay, welcome, welcome back everybody. So on to agenda proper. Um, apologies, I will start by moving that the committee accepts the apology from Councillor David Benson Pope for lateness or absence and from Councillor Doug Hall for absence. Seconded Councillor Staines. All those in favour? Against? Carried. I shall also move that the committee confirms the agenda uh, with the following alteration to page 65 of the agenda, item 11, review of George Street upgrade rev project revised criteria list, paragraph 21. Seconded Councillor Staines again. All those in favour? All those against? Carried. Okay, and of course, extrapolating from the previous meeting, I will happily move that the committee uh, notes the amended elected members' interest register and confirms the proposed management plan for elected members' interests. Seconded, Councillor Lofiso. Those in favour? Against? Carried. And confirmation of minutes, and as pointed out yesterday by Councillor O'Malley, you'll be cognizant of the fact now that committee meetings, minutes of committee meetings are now going to be confirmed by committees as to correctness rather than being noted at council meetings, in which case I will move that the committee confirms the public part of the minutes of the Planning and Environment Committee meeting held on 22nd September 2020 as a correct record. Seconded uh, his worship. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Okay, Pare reports. Item six, actions from resolutions of Planning and Environment Committee meetings. Anybody got any questions? Questions arising from the action report? Nope, in which case I shall once again move that the committee notes the open and completed actions from resolutions of planning and environment committee meetings as at 17th November 2020. Seconded to Councillor Lord. All those in favour? Against? Carried. And item seven, planning and environment committee forward work programme. I'll assume by previous silence that, oh, Councillor Elder. Well, usually we Zoom past these once we've s done in favour. I just want to make a comment, um, um, and that is that um, these reports are extensive and are, they are really, really great for us tracking our work. So I want to thank um, all those who are doing these reports because it makes it clearer what our work program is and what our forward priorities are. I'm sure you'll be delighted to move. Yes, I'm happy to move. Would you like to? Yes, please. Well, please do it. Yeah, I'll move that these are accepted. You're moving that <laughs> the committee notes the Planning and Environment Committee forward work program as at November 2020. Seconded, Councillor Lafiso. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. Okay, we're on planning and environment activity report for the quarter ending 30 September. Nicola Pinfold and Paul Henderson, welcome. I'll uh, just start by just thanking you for a very, very fulsome report. Um, and you want to speak to it or are you just happy to take it as read and go straight to questions? Happy to take it as read. Thank okay, you. so questions? Uh, Councillor Bar Barker. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I just have a, a couple of um, questions on page 41, number point 21. It just talks about the decrease in parking infringement numbers, um, which could be attributed to the increased working from home due to COVID. And I wondered whether another reason could possibly be um, that there were less visitors in Dunedin over that time as well. I think it's a very good point, yes. So the, my next question is, obviously we've got a lot of um, uh, what do you call it? KPIs related to um, time of turning things over, et cetera, et cetera. Do we ask our customers who use our services directly how they've found them, i.e. internal customer satisfaction surveys? I know we use the ROS, as, mm -hmm. but that might not be all the people that have actually used the um, council um, <laughs> services. Yeah, I, I mean, we're currently in the process of uh, introducing the Smile experience, um, which is hopefully going to be in the CSA in the next few days, which will capture feedback from customers firsthand, and then we've got to think about what we're going to do with that information. Um, yeah, so there are various mechanisms where we've got feedback coming through. That's the new stuff that's coming online. 
Thank you. My th third and final question was just wondering when um, we might expect the, fin the annual State of the Environment report as promised in the 2016 um, Environment Strategy document. I don't um, have a precise date for when that um, when that would be coming back to you, but it's something that can be taken back to the Teo Tūrua partnership, and we can come back at a later date. Thank you, Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, I've got some questions around the building services, um, and when I look at uh, paragraph 13 on page 39. Um, talking about pressure also being seen for plumbing and drainage inspectors, which have currently been booked seven to eight days out, is that um, is that still the case? Are we able to? Is it just the workload? Is there is it coming down sometime soon? Um, so as at yesterday, uh, we're out at six days. Normally, we try to operate within a two to five window. Um, and we are expecting now that most of the mandatory training that we've had a number of our plumbing and drainage inspectors on has now finished. Um, so we are expecting that to be back within the uh, two to five working days shortly. Okay. Um, I also look at paragraph 15 where it talks about uh, building consent applications being processed. Um, and is it ideally they're processed within 20 days, working days, or 20 days, or 20 working days? So the way that the 20 working days is calculated is the time that staff have to process it. So, so we receive a consent, the clock started, the clock stops when we, are asked for, when we ask for further information. So that's of the designers or the applicants. Um, so at that point we are required to stop the clock. Once all of that information has come back in, we restart the clock. And so it's, it's only the time that the processing officers have to, to process that consent is where the 20 days is captured. Okay, so when I hear people talking about the length of time it takes to get a consent, uh, where is the hold up? So I'm, I'm hearing people taking, and you and I had a bit of an email dialogue on this where the answer I got was up to 55 days was approximately the time. Is, where is the delay taking place? Um, so there's, there's a number of answers for that. I guess I can, I can only count the days that we have it, and that's the bits that aud it's audited and reported on. So that's the 20 working days maximum that we're allowed. Um, so, so where the delays will be is that we will ask for further information from architects and designers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it just takes time for that information to come back in. So it could literally be sat with an architect for weeks. So a lot of the delay is caused outside of the DCC building? Absolutely. So, so we, I say we only count the 20, the 20 working days is what we're allowed by statute. Um, so that's what we report on, that's what we're audited on. Um, so yeah, any, any delays outside of that is not council. Okay, thank you. Okay. Councillor Lord. Yeah, look, I just had a wee question. It's, it's not quite related to the chat, but it was... Um, at different times there has been requests from some of the suburban areas for more um, parking controls and you know I'm just wondering have you got people out working in the suburbs well and the other question I have is when you see vehicles on the side of the road parked but with wheels off and on jacks and that sort of stuff is that legitimate behaviour is that people allowed to leave cars up on jacks for ages? So we, we do have people um, patrolling the suburbs um, yeah we have rosters and with regards to a car, if it's, if it's identified as abandoned, it goes through the abandoned vehicle process. There's no problem with people fixing cars and leaving them for months on end if it's not abandoned. If someone still claims ownership of it, they're allowed to just do that? If it's on public land, we'd probably, if we receive a complaint, we'd follow it up. Never a dull moment with a Councillor Lord question. Uh, Councillor Elder. Thank you, Chair. Um, given that um, the resource consents are up 20, building consent numbers are up 20% on five year average, and resource consents up 7% on average, and a 25% increase in requests for new subdivision consents, 
compared to the same time period last year. That's a huge increase in workload. My question is, um, have we got capacity or do we need to build more capacity in a growing, growing uh, need in this area? So I'll talk from a building services point of view. Um, I have to say I've been really fortunate with working with the ELT who provided we with resource a few years ago cool. um, and, and we're still uh, obviously developing those individuals. So in answer to your question, at this point I'm certainly not asking for more resource from the ELT. If, if that continued at 20% increase then that might become a different question, but at the minute um, I'm still confident that we can retain the 20 working day time frame. A question related to that, which, which is um, related to that, is um, should once the second generation plan, you know, gets accepted, will that increase the number of um, kind of building consents and um, subdivision consents foreseeably? Um, I'm not sure I can answer that because um, I guess it's a, a future question. Um, Bit of a chicken in uh, yeah, oh, um, and certainly, certainly from the conversations that I have with the uh, um, main home builders is that there is demand out there for land yes. um, and so I guess and, and it was reported in the ODT recently regarding the subdivision and the sale of land etc so uh, but I can't answer it I guess definitively. So in the foreseeable future you might be coming back to us but we don't know that for sure. Thank you. And thanks for all the work you're doing. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gary. Uh, two questions, Building Services. The first one, is it correct, in addition to the answers you gave, uh, Councillor Wiley, that one of, the delay, uh, one of the aspects of the delays is around the quality of applications? Um, it certainly is one factor, absolutely. We have a mixed bag of quality that comes through from consents that have a very few number of requests for further information and ones that are really high volumes. What we are trying to do though, we are trying to work specifically with, I guess, our um, more challenging architects on a one-to-one -one basis and trying to educate them where we can um, and even invite them into the office and spend some time with them so that we can, we can help them. Thank you. My second question is around that six-year high-level uh, item, uh, paragraph 12. And anecdotally, one hears that um, there was a flurry after lockdown of people doing up this, that and the next thing um, uh, in terms of building consents. Uh, do you anticipate, with the borders still closed mm -hmm. and people being unable to take overseas holidays, do you expect that level to continue? I mean, that's anecdotal stuff that we're hearing, but um, may explain uh, why this is happening. Um, yeah, I guess it's the um, people have got money in their pockets, or some people have got money in the pockets, um, and if you're sat at home doing your COVID work or whatever you're doing, and you're thinking, oh, blimey, I'd like to put in a new fire because it's not burning as well as I thought it was, or I want to put in a new heat pump, or, you know, that there is that home improvement scenario. So certainly the increase that we're seeing is primarily around home improvement work. Thank you. Mayor Hawkins. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, thank you, Mr Henderson. In terms of the request for information process, regardless of the calibre of... Uh, the application you receive, at what point through that 20-day period do you think it would be reasonable for staff to know that further information would be required? So, it dep I guess at the minute we are looking at consents, some consents at day 15 or 16, and that's the first time that we will look at it. Um, so I guess that's the point where the RFI process, uh, request for further information, will, will potentially start. Um, the aim, long-term aim, is to bring the average number of working days down to eight, um, but obviously once you get a 20% increase in volumes, that, that puts the pressure on those, those volumes. Um, but longer term, the aim is to, to bring that number down so that we are looking at them sooner, um, and then, again, I guess it speeds up the whole process. Sorry, is that something you would anticipate reporting back on through a, a, through a forum like this? Um, we can do, yeah, absolutely. The data is available, yes. Uh, Councillor Houlihan. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, given we've got a housing crisis in Dunedin, um, do you think the council is doing everything it can to make it easier for developers to get houses and consents approved? Um, again, I, I can only talk from a building consenting point of view. Um, I might pass for the Sorry, resource. Mr. Hen I, don't, I don't feel obliged to answer that question. It's not appropriate. No, Oh, it's just that this is about planning and building and consents. Do you have another question? Yes, I do. Um, I'm getting quite a lot of complaints from people that the different departments aren't talking to each other. Is that, are we able to improve that in any way? Councillor, um, the internal processes are something that I am looking at as the new chief executive and how to streamline um, the end-to-end -end processing of applications is front and centre of my mind. Okay. And Councillor Hulan, I'm, I'm allow you to ask another question, but please can we just focus questions on the content of the paper? Yes, this paper yep. is about consent. No, no, that's building. fine. So next question. Yeah. Um, so uh, some people have also said that when they've got a building consent, you know, to get signed off, they don't have the same person come back each time. They get a different person, and then it causes a lot of work and a bit of. Is there any way we can look at reviewing that? Or is that? You know. I'm sorry. As I've said, Councillor, we are looking at our process, um, and I don't think it's fair to put Mr. Henderson on the spot at the minute while we have a look at the process in the round. So those operational decisions, um, I would intend to make at an operational level, not at the governance level. If, you, if people have um, specific examples, they are welcome to forward them to me and Mr. Pickford, and we will um, address them. Thank you. I have given them to Mr. Pickford. Uh, Councillor Lafiso. Tenakoi, Mr. Chair. Tenakorua. Um, Tenakoi, Mr. Henderson. I, my question too is about building services, and I just want to say congratulations and thank you to the team uh, for uh, for dealing with uh, the challenges uh, in that space. And I'm just wondering. Um, you said. Uh, to Councillor Aldo, you didn't require further resource, but at, in terms of the system and the communications of successes and how you're working, is that is that easily networked out via the, the Council's website page or a, an attention? Because what I get, and I'm not a I'm not interested in DIY or any of that stuff, but I know that um, you know the perception out there is people are still locked back 10 years ago or whenever, saying, oh, the, the council is not friendly and it's not um, in favour of business and all that crap, excuse me. Um, but what I want to do is, as a... As a well, thank you. Continue, continue, please. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so... I just want to, um, as a politician, you know, having to defend or, you know, say to people, you're not getting the whole story. So is, is there any work that could be done? I don't know where. But to communicate, yes, we are meeting these milestones. Yes, we are positive. We are pro, we are pro development building. Uh, from the consenting perspective, there are um, publications that go out monthly to the development community about um, about the, the consent numbers that are being processed, and so they're um, conveying conveying the good news on that on that front. I'm always interested in warm homes and helping people have warm homes, and so I was really interested in your. Um, point at number point 24, home energy audit kits. Just could you t um, unpack that a wee bit and what's in these kits? Um, yep, so it's got a hygrometer, um, which is about measuring air temperatures, uh, moisture levels, etc., and also tips on how to avoid uh, cold, damp conditions that cause condensation. It's got an infrared thermometer to be able to assess. Um, I guess where you've got the cold spots and things like that. It's got a stopwatch so you can measure flow rates, et cetera. So it's, a, it's, a, it's basically a pack that you can look at your own home and, and decide whether or not you'd like to do some home improvement work 
and then I'll get a consent off you. So, so it's sort of like a detective kit for people's homes, for where you know, in the sense of detecting yes. um, and analysing what's happening in the home environment. Yes. Is that right? Yes. So, how do people get a hold of these? Um, so we can hire them. Um, so I'll, again, I'll take that offline if that's okay, and I'll, I'll send you the details through. Oh, so I can hire them off the yep. city council. Yep. Cool. Okay. Thank you. They they sound really interesting, and certainly my house needs a bit of that. <laughs> Thank you. Does somebody want to move that we note that report? Councillor Gary, seconded Councillor Staines. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor Gary? Uh, yes, I would. Um, I'd just like to congratulate um, the team on the amount of work, and particularly in the building services area, on the amount of work uh, that they have been um, processing uh, with this unexpected outcome of lockdown. I don't think anyone predicted it. Um, and it's a positive thing. Who knows how long it will last, uh, the home improvement drive. Um, and I also want to just comment on the work of the um, ECHO advisor, that really important work that she does out in our community with um, uh, vulnerable people in cold homes. Um, and the referrals that she gets. And the other thing I wanted to comment on was biodiversity, uh, wearing my uh, grants subcommittee hat, uh, particularly impressed with the work done by Richard Ewans uh, in attracting first-time applicants uh, to this fund. Um, there's a considerable number of first-time applicants that we saw in this last round, and that's good news for the biodiversity of our city. So congratulations to all of those uh, team members who produced those results. Thank you. Other speakers? Right of reply to your own note. Nope. Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Uh, work plan, work plan reserve management plan reviews. To read and Mr. Reed and Mr. McLean, thank you for the report. Do you want to speak to it, or happy to go straight, take it as read and go to questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Happy to take questions. Questions. Councillor Lafisa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you um, both. Uh, I just have a question. I'm um, just it's. Vague, sorry, it's point fifteen, and it's about the Auckland Reserve. But so, what would um, what would that look like for the new uh, the well? What's the current um, RMP like? It's for the octagon. Uh, so we don't currently have an octagon reserve management plan. Um, what it would look like would largely depend on future. Um, upgrades and urban design work, so we would wait until that work was completed to ensure that uh, our reserve was protected but also maximise the benefits of any upgrade work in the future, centre city upgrade work. Uh, and so just coming from the community perspective, uh, you know, uh, supporting people who want to use the Octagon for gatherings and stuff, would this still be um, accessed via the events team or through you guys? Sorry. Uh, through the chair, uh, would obviously work uh, really closely, and we do with with our events team. So, people's access uh, to the to the reserve wouldn't um, necessarily change, but we'd manage that through our booking systems. Uh, Councillor Elder, um, just I, I think it's a great idea. I think reserves um, all change in, in how people use them. So I was just wondering. Um, what do you see the outcomes of having an updated reserve management plan being, you know, for the community? Uh, through the chair, day-to-day um, -day management of reserves wouldn't change greatly. Uh, reserve management plans um, are sort of more to guide high-level and strategic um, decisions, um, potential development opportunities. Um, they also give us the ability to recognise any changing um, trends or, or increased knowledge. Um, so yes, yeah, so day to day potential opportunities, um, but longer term, just looking at that um, that vision. Correct. 
you were, oh. the other the other thing is so your process is to consult key stakeholders in in these areas yeah okay under the reserves act that's a requirement Thank you. Uh, Your Worship. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And tēnā kōroa. Just picking up on Councillor Lofusel's question around the octagon um, and then the subsequent response to a question when you were talking about reserve management plans functioning as a way to, at a high level, guide development or public use of a space. Um, but the, the plan, and I appreciate that it's unassigned in the current schedule, but the plan sounds to me. Um, to your earlier answer that you're going to wait for all of that potential development or a, or reuse to take place and then do the management plan rather than in reverse? Am I, did I understand that correct? You're, the, the, the waiting for the outcomes of whatever the central city plan would provide for the... No, I think and then it will be done in conjunction. I'll probably ah. give an example. The Botanic Garden is a really good example at the moment that um, we're trying to do the strategic planning work at the same time as the reserve management plan so that they, 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 they interweave with each other. Yeah, that's fine. So Thank that's you. probably how we would do it. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I noticed the Mosgiel Memorial Reserve Management Plan is taking into account Peter Johnson Park Memorial Park and the Memorial Gardens and that rather unique blend. Um, and to your answer to Councillor Fiso, I assume it's along the same thing, that you're looking at a strategic um, mechanism to understand how you're going to develop it. I'm conscious of the fact that Logan Park went through a development plan and then that's been somewhat shelved. Is there any reason you're doing Memorial Park and, and not doing a Logan Park one? And is there any similarity or differences between those two that would make one be on the list and the other one not? Uh, through the chair, um, the reason we're focusing on um, the Mosgiel Memorial Park Garden and Peter Johnson Park is there is a lot of discussion through the designation process of of that area, uh, and a management plan would support that um, multi-use, multi-function um, area under that designation. So, I think that's a good idea. I'm wondering why why we wouldn't be doing the same thing where you've got multi-use multi-group um, units at Logan Park as well. I think often people draw the parallel between those two as being quite similar. Memorial Park being less further down the development line in Logan Park, but nevertheless large spaces, multiple users, all that sort of stuff. Uh, through the Chair, so we're currently undertaking a strategic sports facilities review. Uh, Logan Park's obviously part of, of that, so we're in the process of engaging with key stakeholders uh, and we will take that out for public consultation uh, in the future. Uh, Councillor Houlihan. Um, yes, with the octagon, I actually had queries around that as well. And excuse my naiveness for this because I didn't. Uh, my question is really, what will that mean? You know, what is the implication of the octagon having a, a reserve management plan? I just didn't know what it meant, but it's probably something quite simple. But what are the implications for that if that happens and when that happens? What does that mean for the people who use the octagon? Uh, through the chair, it would be too early to say exactly what it, what it would mean, but it would just provide some structure um, around that. It's a very it's our most high-profile reserve in the city, um, so it's an opportunity to recognise um, its location, the uniqueness uh, and the value that it adds to the city. So it's about wrapping some structure around decisions around the, the use of the reserve itself. Right. So are you talking about just the land, you know, the grassy areas, or the whole area of the octagon? like the road around it as well, or just the grass? Um, the, reserve, uh, the reserve itself is about half the space. The rest of it is transport land. It's, um, it's road reserve. So there's like two semicircles that, that constitutes the octagon reserve. Okay. So it would be in conjunction with transport and urban design um, when we draft a management plan. Okay, and that'll all be included in the whole, so it would have a management reserve including those whole areas? Uh, that hasn't been determined yet. Oh, I see. Yep. OK. What is the hope that you hope to achieve by that? Like, I'm just wondering why we do them. That's all. I just honestly don't know. That's why. Um, 
I, I don't think I don't think the officer can answer that because obviously it's part of a public consultation and drafts oh. come to council, so we can't predetermine the outcome of that. No, no, I wasn't asking for predetermining. I was just wanting to know why we do it. That's all. That's part of the resource management tax and the expectation we have reserve management plans. Yeah. Okay. And and a requirement under the Reserves Act is something that we have to do. Oh right, yep. that we have to have a reserve on the octagon. Oh, yep. that we have to have a plan for reserves. Oh, right. All reserves have to have a management plan of some type. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, Th thank you. Um, just to know that all that information was covered off in the papers that, that we were given. Um, in the absence of further questions, I'm going to move that the committee notes the reserve management plan review forward work plan. Second to Councillor Lofiso. Um, all those in favour? Uh, what? Too late. Why not? Here you can. Well, I'll just speak to it anyway because it won't change the outcome. It's the, it's the, it's looking at the Memorial Park and then knowing that there was a lot of work done on Logan Park a long time ago that I'd implore staff to reconsider going forward that maybe in addition to Memorial Park, which I think is a really good follow-up following the designation work, um, and it and it's needed out there for sure, um, but I think we. We have another very similar activity at Logan Park, which is again a, a really has become a city asset park, not just the park at the north end of town. And I would just encourage staff to consider maybe a plan be designated around them as well. Excuse my my, my speed, like Councillor Liffey so previously. Anyone else want to speak? No. Nope. Okay, it's been moved and carried. Okay. Uh, St Kilda Coastal Plan Mid Engagement Update. Mr. Drew, Simon, Mr. Simon Smith, thank you for joining us. As I've said previously, are you happy to take the report as read and request ready questions? Correct. Thank you. Questions? Uh, Councillor Elder. Um, just looking at, oh, thanks for all your work, by the way. You're doing a great job. Um, I'm just looking at feedback themes, and um, that's point 21, and uh, it says a resilient coastline that serves to protect the inland area from the effects of coastal storms and sea level rise. So was that one of the major themes coming through? What Can you talk to that? Yeah, happy to. Yeah, so part of what we do with our engagement process is not just understand what m people might want to see happen but also some of the threats that mm -hmm. our community perceives um, and one of the big things that came through our process is um, yeah essentially you know a bit of um, trepidation or you know a um, bit of worry or concern about um, sea level rise this big scary thing that is climate change and coastal erosion and storms so um, but obviously fundamental to this program of work is that. So mm -hmm. um, all these sort of community value things like amenity and recreation and access and environment, um, they're really the core things that we've drawn out of the engagement process, whereas the hazard mitigation is kind of like the, the given. You, you need that, and you probably need all these other community-oriented things too now, but we've heard that. So, um, yeah, they... they, they we deal with them slightly differently, but yeah, it was a, one of the main themes that we heard, yes. So what you're saying is there's, there's the hazard part and the risk part that you're dealing with, as well as the public community part and what people want out of that space? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's actually really important. So part of what is, I guess, quite challenging with any sort of coastal management work is that it's easy to just find, or somewhat easy to simply find an erosion solution. Um, but how does that solution or mitigation measure actually interact with how people want to use the beach? Um, and that's ultimately the, the balance that we're looking for here. What, how can we you know, solve the environmental challenge um, while also restoring or retaining or enhancing a public as asset and amenity um, for our community? So it's a balancing act here. So w would you say the approach then um, for the coastal plan is an adaptive pathways approach uh, similar to the South Dunedin Futures project? Yeah, so we, we do use the adaptive planning framework. Um, I guess 
there's going to be different um, for these different parts of the coast, like St Clair, Middle Beach and St Kilda, there'll be different management options that we'll be proposing for these different areas based on the outcomes that our community might like to see at these different spaces, also based on the viability of different options mm -hmm. at these different sections of beach and also based on how these different options might synergise with each other. So, um, yeah, it's not going to be a blanket approach. There's no silver bullet, but, um, yeah, it's quite complicated, yeah. Thank you. Um, Councillor Van Vers, I wasn't sure if you indicated, did you want to speak? I was going to suggest that I was happy to move, but since you had questions, I withdrew. Councillor Gary. Thank you. Mr Simmons-Smith, I wonder if you could tell us, were there any surprises for you in the process to date in terms of the feedback you've received, the engagement? I know you will have gone into it with an open mind, okay. but, but there will be there would have been some feedback that wouldn't have been a surprise. Was there any that was surprising? Yeah, um, I guess one of the things I've found somewhat surprising is how difficult it is to get our community to think in a sort of aspirational fashion and to think big picture. Um, you know, we've had you know, many, many sessions with different community groups um, and people always quite naturally move towards the day-to-day -day and things like facilities and rubbish collection and parking and things like that. So, you know, our job is to, to listen to that but also try and get people thinking bigger picture about climate change and long-term future and things like that. So I guess that's something I've found somewhat interesting or, um, yeah, surprised me a little bit. Um, it's, it's important, the feedback nonetheless. Yeah. So if I turn that question around <clears throat> and ask you a second one, um, have you noted any surprises for people as they've been involved in this process and learnt uh, how complex the, process, the issues are? Yeah, um, a huge part of this project has been educational. Um, if any, you know, if you know of any people that have come to our workshops, you know, we always ended up with people just walking away saying they learnt a hell of a lot, which is which was really cool actually. Um, and it's quite rewarding for us, so um, that's been great. And I think also just for them to put a face to this work has also been great for them. We have a lot of people saying we didn't know there were people putting this much thought and time into this, which has also been yeah, quite nice for us to hear as well. Yeah. Thank you for all the work you're doing Thank in this area. Uh, Councillor Raddick. Yeah, um, I guess there has been a couple. I guess I guess what I would firstly say is, but the we're we're about two thirds, we're about sixty percent of the way through our engagement process, right? And the first part of our process has been more around understanding the outcomes or objectives that our community might like to see. You know, the the value setting and objective setting. So yeah. that hasn't necessarily encouraged that sort of feedback, but we do have it nonetheless. So I guess some of the more innovative stuff, um, people are always really keen to talk about things like beach, beach recharge and the opportunities that might come from working with groups like Port Otago. Um, some other innovative ideas have been around um, low profile groins and um, immovable groins or removable groins. Um, other things around dune plantings and um, managed realignment and things like that. So. Um, they're never things that um, I've never heard of, but they're always, it's always interesting to hear them come from a community voice and to hear people talk about how they feel they would work in the Dunedin context, because um, Kiwis love to think that you know, we can maybe do things quite, quite um, yeah, on the cheap in some cases, to be quite fair. Um, so it's an interesting discussion to, to have. <laughs> Yes, and in, in the summary, feedback is, con is centred on values that um, are most focus on natural uh, elements. How do submitters reconcile the erosive effect of the Esplanade seawall with the desire for natural landscape? Yeah, so how the... I guess what's most relevant there, I guess, is that there's going to be certain outcomes that will be pushed based on the feedback we've had today and based on the viability of options that um, 
you know, the future will look different for St Clair than it will St Kilda. And I guess what I mean by that is there's there's more opportunity from a from a management perspective to do um, to work with nature, for example, at St Kilda than there is at St Clair. Um, you know, and the discussion around managed realignment and longer term retreat is easier to have at places like Middle Beach and St Kilda than it is at St Clair as well. So um, we are hearing a lot of people talk about how much they value the Esplanade and close proximity to the coast. And if you've seen the surveys we have up on our website at the moment, um, we've also been seeing that people are valuing these different things more or less at different parts of the coast. So an example would be people are really valuing environment at St Kilda, but things like access and connectivity and proximity to the coast are actually quite high up the list at St Clair, for example. So that's interesting for us to understand and unpick. Um, and it helps when we actually start to draft this plan to think about what can this coastal system as a whole be for our community, because it doesn't have to achieve every single thing at every single part of the coast. Yeah. Yes, how, how highly does the community value that seawall, you know, the Esplanade? Uh, immensely. Um, I think there'd be, there'd be no way of saying that, that they don't. I guess the, the divergence would be in um, a willingness or not to consider things like um, a removal of car parks, for example, um, in order to achieve a, a seawall that might be shaped differently or positioned differently um, to achieve a better hazard management outcome but at the cost of things like car parks and roadside and things like that. So people want the Esplanade to, to stay there but um, at what cost and in what way that's where we see the divergence. Yeah. Yeah. And do you offer any uh, mitigation against the corrosive effects of that seawall in, in discussion with them or you just wait, let them yeah. put up with their suggestion? Yes, so, so how, how the plan will work is we've, we've gathered all this feedback, we, we now feel like we have a really good grasp of what people care about and what people value and then we then work with our technical team to develop a set of adaptive pathways that we feel will achieve mm. the outcomes that our community has agreed, um, agreed upon or told us that they feel are important. So we'll then come back with the draft plan early next year and talk and this will include some of the mitigation options that are proposed um, to achieve what people want at these different parts of the coast. So that will be another chance for people to to provide feedback on all of that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Cool. Thank, thank you, Councillor Rajic. Excellent questions. Um, Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, so in the process right now, you've done this first phase of community engagement, and I'm just looking at um, figure three on paragraph 12 on page 91, which is the Middle Beach component of it. Kettle Park. Where on that figure are we at the moment? Yeah, sorry, that um, decision making framework that I put up there. So we are about, yeah, so we're between um, steps two and three, essentially, right. of those two things. Um, so I guess what I would say is they're not sized in proportion to the amount of time they take to complete. So, um, for example, those rows three and four. Um, we work really um, with, you know, we start and we can move those in the background to some degree in terms of long listing on options. So we've already started our long listing of options in the background and we also, f the community feedback feeds into that. So if we've missed some gaps and things like that, we can draw that in. Um, but really where the community adds value is helping us understand which of this long list of options might actually achieve the outcomes and that's how we start to shortlist it and cut it back. and actually arrive at preferences. Yeah. And then I assume you'll do a benefit cost analysis of some sort and that'll be sort of help you make the decision, which is getting to my main question is, do you know how big the Kittle Park landfill is and do you have any estimates of what the costs would be of the different options that you would be going forward with on that environment and how does that, if there's a yes to that, how does that help you um, inform the debate with the community? Yeah. Yeah, so... It will be, in the long term, if we're talking about the landfill proper, um, it will be very expensive. I, I, we don't know exactly what it will cost. We need to do part of what the coastal plan is also going to set out is what are our gaps in terms of knowledge. And without a doubt, we're going to be needing to get a better picture of what's actually under there and um, 
under what you know what volumes of material and to, to what degree of contamination we have been working with a consultancy to help us understand the contamination within the June phase which is not the landfill proper and we've been looking at the cost of some of the different management options for that section for example and those options are in the order of you know hundreds of thousands to low millions in terms of dealing with the contamination in the June phase but the material under the land under the playing fields proper you know I would only be guessing but it would be tens you know high tens of millions I would imagine or upwards yeah, yeah. Uh, Councillor Wiley um, thank you. Um, Tom, what sort of uh, winter have we had or spring in a re regards to salt storm surges and everything? It seems to have been pretty quiet overall. Yeah, yeah the, this last um, season is, has been the calmest since I've been working in the coastal field in Dunedin since 2014. Um, so lucky would be, would be fair. Um, and yeah, so I guess the thing is we always have some storms and we had a couple of them in, in May in lockdown, um, so we had to do a little bit of work out there, but in terms of the maintenance end it's been very low in terms of cost, but obviously that doesn't mean that that's any clue to what might happen next year and it can always change, but yeah, it's been a, it's been a good year in terms of um, sand retention. Um, and access and things like that um, in the winter months, and which has probably been important because last year was was quite rough for, for Middle Beach, for Kettle Park, in terms of how much sand we lost. Um, yeah. So do you think that has having any impact on some of the engagement you're getting? Because I guess for councillors and council, when we have a big, like, like last year, we get quite a lot of voices jumping up and down and um, asking us to do more? Mm. and Or have you heard from those voices uh, in this process? Yeah, um, I guess we can, we can never be sure. Um, the, the people that, you know, the regulars that I typically see at, at workshops and drop-in sessions and meetings, um, they've been along for this ride in terms of the coastal plan process without a doubt. Um, so I don't feel like we have we've lost anyone um, because of the, the better weather. Um, but you're right that more people do come to the surface when, when bad things happen. And ultimately this process is about making sure that that's not the, that's not the guiding light for Dunedin City Council in terms of hazard management, in terms of coastal management. It, it shouldn't be about responding to storms, it should be about knowing that they are going to happen and thinking about what we can do to manage it and making sure that our community still enjoys that space. So. That's the focus, um, but in terms of the engagement, really hard to tell. Yeah. And happy to grant you another go, Councillor Raddick. Very short, specific question, specifically about the St Clair poles. How many people have asked for the repair of those poles back to a groin? Yeah, um, they've come up a lot in terms of discussion, would be really fair. Um, that we would have had dozens of people um, either through our online surveys or at, at drop-in sessions wanting to talk about them without a doubt. Um, in terms of the number of people that have you know, told me that they are the solution and um, have you know, been a bit more forward on that, it would be much, much lower numbers. Um, I, I guess the important thing for me is that everyone that I've talked to, or the vast majority of people that I've talked to about the polls, about the groins, have, have wanted to talk about what they if what value they feel they might add, and then I've talked to them about um, you know the positives that I think might come from them, and then also some of the risks that you know we might perceive. Um, you know, certainly um, with all this adaptive planning approach, no option is sort of ever off the table, and um, sand retention, at, particularly at St Clair, is a, an important focus for what we we'll need to be doing. So, yeah. Thank you. So Councillor Vandervis has indicated his willingness to move. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Lofiso. Councillor Vandervis, would you like to speak to it? No, thank you. Any other speakers? Put the motion. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Um, before we go on to item 11, I'm going to move partly in personal, in personal interest and demands calling, calling on me that we adjourned for 10 minutes, seconded by His Worship. All those in favour?
councillors, welcome back. We're about to move on to item 11, review of George Street upgrade project. And I welcome Dr. Emma Johnson and Mr. Drew to the table. As I've said consistently all day, are you, do you want to speak to it or are you happy to take the report as read and go straight to questions? Um, if I may, I thought it might be helpful just to provide some clarification around the relationship between the peer review findings and recommendations and the staff recommendations that are in the report and the developed business case process and therefore sort of the, what needs to be decided. So um, I'd start by um, drawing your attention to the decision pathways that were highlighted um, by Mr. Mintz on page 103 of the agenda. So um, the peer review recommendation was that um, a flexible design be adopted and that flexible design could uh, be used as a two-way street or one-way street and then um, you had to make a decision at some point about at what do you start with a one-way or two-way and the peer review um, focused in on the decision that also needs to be considered in future around providing for a bus service through George Street which may be in the form of the inner city bus loop but could be um, the maintenance of the existing bus service that runs through there that services Norman B to St. Clair. And um, the feedback in the peer review that a two-way street would enable the bus service to um, be provided on the street more readily or almost exclusively provide for it. So the staff recommendations, um, option one and option two and option three are all based on the peer review finding. They are essentially all what was recommended there. And um, in terms of going through to the um, DBC process, the critical thing is to determine whether we um, stay with the previous council resolution, which was for a one-way severed um, design or move to this flexible design. Um, the options in here indicate um, choosing from a, a starting point at this stage, whether we start with one-way or two-way, but that choice of where you start is probably not necessary to move on to the DBC. It might save some time through that process, but certainly the process could be run just with the flexible design um, and any other option that you, you wanted to include there. So that I think the critical difference is whether you're moving from the flexible design to the flexible design from the one-way severed option that was previously presented to council or any other option um, that was you know, shown in this documentation, which is a fixed one way or a fixed two way or, you know, the various other options that were considered and that the um, Central City Advisory Group were asked about, if that's helpful. Thank you, Dr. Charles. That's very helpful, actually, that clarification. Um, so happy to move on to questions. Yep. Uh, Mayor Hawkins. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Um, a question, not sure for whom, um, perhaps for Mr. Drew, and it's around um, the degree of detail that is required, and I think we're all interested in progressing this work as efficiently as possible, but uh, were council of a mind, or the committee of a mind, to support uh, the one-way design option as the starting point? Would we need to decide on the direction of travel at this meeting, or can that be dealt with through de the detailed design phase? Uh, yeah, I'd recommend that was decided through the detailed design phase. You don't need to decide if it's north or south here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm happy to move that in due course once you've dealt with once you've dealt with questions. Thanks, uh, Councillor Elder. Um, something I'm quite interested in because, in fact, um, it's about accessibility. Is the number of people who have talked to me about um, the fact that the bus hub is a long way away from the main street and that in fact um, a lot of older people and a lot of people um, 
with disability have talked to me about the fact that it makes it very hard for them to access George Street. And I was just wondering um, about the loop bus and how that would function and what's the best way for it to function to enable that access. Um, both the one-way and the two-way options will work for a loop bus. Um, it, it's just, I guess, more desirable for a service if you can run it two-way, more to do with frequency and duration of trip. So, for example, if a bus was running from stops one to eight and you hopped on at seven on a one-way, you'd have to go eight and all the way back around to get to six, so your duration is longer than if you're on a two-way service, you could cross the road and head straight back to six, but neither one-way or two-way precludes a bus service. With the, um, the bus loop, has there been, um, um, is there a, a desired route? Is there a, pick, um, a desired route? There, there are draft routes that will come to council in a separate report. So, um, with the with the loop bus, could that actually have the desired effect of decreasing the number of people having to use cars into the area because they could use a loop bus? Correct, potentially. Yeah. Um, thank you. That's all my. Barker. Thank you, Chair. I have a few questions. Not that many, though. <laughs> Is there a plan to address the missing link to the octagon? I guess that's for Council to decide. Thank you. <laughs> um, and can you advise on the danger status at Georgian Frederick Street? Sorry, can you repeat the, the danger status? It's been mentioned in, through various reports that part of addressing the the two way, one way option on George Street was to address some of the dangerous intersection. Oh, there. the five way, yes. Sorry, mm. so uh, the five way intersection at London Pit George is one of the most dangerous intersections in the country. Um, the one way option um, precludes movement in one direction at that intersection, so. It, cuts down on the uh, the movements through the intersection and therefore makes it safer. Thank you. Uh, my other question is around the um, Centre City Advisory Group and I know we started off in Council with requesting that there were certain members on it etc cetera, etc cetera. and I wonder how many members it ended, ended up on it? Uh, the um, the terms of reference allowed for people to be co-opted in and f onto the group, and for interest groups also to be um, to be um, included if they were if they had a representative membership. So we've um, at the last um, last count we had 35 people who have attended attended the, the the meetings and provided feedback. Are you able to give me a list of what groups they represented and? A Possibly the numbers of people that they were representing. Uh, we have a list of of who who was representing which groups, not necessarily um, the numbers mm -hmm. of of members of each of those groups. I I was just looking for the um, the balance around the groups. Obviously, we'd off ask that different groups get represented, so um, people are able to self self select in a kind of way. So I just wondered if there was a. Um, a list that everyone here could hear about who was on the group? Oh, I, it's been circulate, oh. circulated earlier today. I thought it might be useful for yeah. other people in the audience to hear. Yeah. So my other question is around the, um, the, question, the advisory group questionnaire, and I just wonder about the methodology behind the, the survey of the questionnaire, and whether it was um, email presented at the meeting, or were people given time to consult with membership groups on their responses. This, this is a question around the fact that there were 35 members on the group and just 17 responded to the survey. So I was just wondering, of the 17 who responded, 
what was the balance and um, did they have time, et cetera, to respond? Um, they, they were original, so the, the survey was presented at the, at the advisory group meeting and we chose to, to give people time to take the question, rather than getting feedback at the meeting, decided to give them time to take the questionnaire away. But it was a short turnaround because we had a, we had a committee meeting or a briefing um, about, uh, about five days later. Um, so we took the feedback after five days, but we also gave the groups another, another week in order to allow them to consult with their groups. So as some have mentioned that they weren't able to make all the meetings. So did all the 35 members of the group get the survey? Yep. Uh, yes, all the people. Um, they were they were all given the opportunity at that second at that at the second mail out for mm -hmm. for all the groups to make sure they had the opportunity. Okay, and so I've just failed to respond. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Benson Pope. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A question um, for Mr. Drew, really. I think further to the question about the loop bus proposal, perhaps. Um, there's a lot of sort of blue skies stuff here, particularly because of what um, Cobus Mintz has introduced to the table as well, and I think that's good. But is it, and, and we, we understand that a two-way option would facilitate a more straightforward operation of a bus service of that kind, but given that we're configuring what we think or how it might be the best configuration, is it inconceivable that a loop bus could run in both directions, even if for vehicle, other vehicles, the street was a one-way street. Would that, could that not be something that could also be achieved, depending on design and priority and, and who had right of way and so on? Yeah, correct, it's not inconceivable. It would uh, probably require a narrower bus than the big, larger vehicles that we're used to, and potentially um, uh, MOT rule change, but it's not inconceivable. So, thank you. Councillor Raddick. Um, looking at the three options, the which of the, how is the ranking of the three options in terms of flexibility and favouritism from the advisory group? Well, the results of the questionnaire are provided to yeah. you. Um, and I would say that it's important to not just consider what people, their, what they prefer, but also what they don't prefer and, and what people's second option is. So in interpreting the results, it's, it's obvious, um, well, I personally found the options that had the highest levels of dissatisfaction more important than the ones that people ranked first, and that's why the options, some of the options were kicked out because they had really high levels of people unhappy with them. But there is um, a few in the middle that people have as one, two, and nobody is really um, entirely dissatisfied with that I think are possibilities. Yeah. Great. So, um, and based on that, of those two options, which one was preferred, the two-way or the one-way? Because there was a, 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 through, uh, a through path as opposed to two directions, uh, because uh, Mr. Mintz had four options listed and selected the first, or two middle ones, is that right? I think the difference between um, the highest preference was for flexible design. Yes. The difference between those that wanted it to start as two way and those that wanted it to start as one way are sort of insignificant, especially given the the size of the group that you're talking about. Mm. So I think both those options I would summarize as fairly equally preferred. Right. So yeah. I'd like to uh, foreshadow an alternative uh, or an uh, option. Uh, that we go with option one. So that would be foreshadowing a, uh, a motion that should the first motion fail, that we go with option one as recommended in the staff report. Thank you. Councillor Staines. Hello. Hey, Mr Chair. Um, 
I know that we aren't picking the direction if we went to a one way, but can you comment on the Pitt Street intersection that if traffic can only enter George Street, therefore coming from north to the south, does that in effect when it comes to the light cycle turn that into a four way intersection because there's no traffic coming out of George Street into that? Yeah, from an intersection traffic safety perspective, that would be the best outcome. Right, thank you. Um, commentary has been made on the hospital rebuild and traffic movements around if we change George Street, what could happen over the hospital. So I've got two questions on that. Um, currently, hospital demolition is underway, so there's quite a lot of activity on the hospital site at the moment. Are there any traffic issues associated with the demolition at the moment? We're not seeing any significant impacts on traffic because of the demolition work. Thanks. Um, and then um, are we anticipating um, in, the, in the short term any changes in the state highway system at the, over the, like in the short term after George Street? Uh, no, we're not anticipating any short term changes to the state highway network. So there is an anticipation potentially that there might be a time gap between what we do in George Street and, and any final decisions on the state highway system based on probably NZTA's ability to fund anything um, at the moment. Correct. Thank you. Councillor Lord. Um, yeah, look, I've got a couple of questions. One of them, just to follow up from Jim's, but uh, I mean, you'll probably have as good a guess as me, but I was going to say, do you anticipate that there'll be a greater, um, like you've just said, that there's not significant problems at the moment with the Cadbury's demolition? And considering the fact that it did used to have 370 employees or whatever, do you anticipate that when the build starts that will follow a similar line, or do you anticipate that the significance of what's happening on site will create more problems? Yeah, it's really difficult to say without seeing the hospital's construction methodology, so I'd be guessing. Yeah, yeah. And the, the other question is that in the report, the preferred option, which I assume Jules was foreshadowed, was the recommended option, and is it still staff's option that that's the preferred option? Oh, look, as a DCC staff member, I'm passionately ambivalent. <laughs> I'll get my dictionary. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Mr Chair. We heard this morning from submitters, and in particular uh, Mary O'Brien and Chris Ford, around the disability community, and we heard how important public community was. Can you outline in detail the, um, the public amenity we will lose, specifically, uh, if we go two-way versus one-way? And I, and I draw attention to page 102, which uh, talks about um, no permanent obstacles, obstacles such as trees or rain gardens. So just putting aside the rain gardens for a moment, which is, um, which is discussed extensively, what, what other aspects of public amenity uh, would we uh, have in a one-way situation and to not have in a two-way situation? I think you can still have all the same aspects of public amenity, you'll just have less. So um, it, I think if you look at the percentages differences that are outlined in the peer review report, that's um, the most helpful way of thinking about it. It's just the space that you have to work with. Uh, you know, a good urban designer will be able to make the best use of the space um, that you present them with and it's certainly either option gives you a reasonable amount of space to work with but obviously the one way gives you more and so it will make it, um, it will shift the balance more towards it being a, a pedestrian focused environment as opposed to some vehicles um, you know moving through the space but I, I think you could do well with either, probably. So, my se thank you. My second question is around the loop bus, and I, let me just check in with you that I understood you correctly that it's possible to have the loop bus under the one way system, but there's a delay in getting around. We heard from the disability community that they saw the ability crossroad was fine. 
There are other, are there not other examples in various parts of the world where you have that kind of loop bus situation? I'm sure I've been on some where you, you just, um, that's part of it, if it's fr particularly if it's free, that you just, that you just endure that extra time knowing that you have an opportunity to get around the route, but if you choose to go from you know, one stop to the other, you have to do the whole loop again. I, I understand there was a meeting um, on this topic as part of the peer review. Um, the public transport planner from ORC was involved in that. Um, apparently there is a loop bus in Invercargill that was discussed at that meeting. However, my understanding is that bus Loop bus, they've had some issues with so as a one-way service, so they're changing that now. Um, my expertise in this area is limited, but certainly I um, think it's something that needs a lot more investigation and more engagement with the ORC on, because the meeting that was held as part of the, the peer review was very quick fire, so that definitely it was discussed, but um, you know, for one for one hour, and it needs more time. Uh, Councillor Hulan. Thank you. Um, can I ask what modelling we've done around if we've got a one, you know, if George Street was put to one way, um, what modelling have we done around the city for the implications that would have on other roads? So we've done high level traffic modelling that um, has seen impacts at some intersections and streets that's been looked at at one way and two way. There's the detailed traffic modelling that everyone's interested in is the next phase of this work. It's the, the detailed business case. And so if council were of a mind to choose a flexible design that is one way that can revert to two way or two way revert to one way, mm. we would have to model both because it's a flexible design and, and at that point we'll have all the detailed um, traffic modelling results. Okay. What, what the uh, high uh, level modelling has said is that um, it just moves traffic to other streets and that we have to strengthen other streets so the level of investment is just a little bit different and the intersection treatments are just a little bit different depending on if you're one way or two way. So when time wise, when would that um, better detail be available? The next level modelling. Um, so, depending on council's resolution today, it could be as sort of early next year that we start seeing the preliminary results. Okay. It'll be towards the middle of next year where the things are being finalised. Mm -hmm. And if we um, say, for example, today the councillors decide to vote for the one way, is that going back to the same, exactly the same? structure or format or roading that we had prior to all this engagement? No, it's not. So the, the previous resolution was based on a design that ha was, um, Mr. Bentz called it a severed one way, and it's um, shown in his report, but essentially there was no through movement in either direction. And that option has, uh, staff recommend that that option isn't taken forward because of um, the issues with with it that came up through the peer review process. Right. Um, instead, it's um, <coughs> recommending that the flexible option with either starting point is the one that's come through that process as um, a better option. So if we, um, say for example, we had a one way and then we find out that it is causing major, you know, major traffic congestion around our city, it, will there be any flexibility around that if we go with the one way to change it back again for say peak times or something? Uh, the flexible design is not sort of instantly flexible, it's more um, changeable without major costs, you know, digging up trees and so it's designed that if um, something changed, like for example you decided to run a, bu a bus service, that it could be changed at a reasonable level of cost. It's designed to be able to be changed, but it's not a, you know, on the weekend it's one thing. And on, However, with um, any design you can have, you can use bollards and things to, to close it down for events, and that certainly can be built into either 
yeah. option, and, and that came through strongly mm -hmm. through the engagement as something that people would like to see. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, I'm not sure who to address this question to, so I'll just pop it up and see who wants to take it. Um, when I read the executive summary and I read the, the process that's taken place, and the last meeting of the Central City Advisory Group place, took place on the 8th of October, is that correct? Okay. Did any did this report go to all the members of the Central City Advisory Group, and that, when did they receive it? Uh, no, what they received um, the same presentation that councillors had, which was the interim findings of the peer review, and it was an opportunity for um, Mr. Mentz to sort of check in with the group on what he thought he had heard. So they received that that presentation, which largely reflects the content in this report, but it, was, it allowed him to um, reflect on that before finalising it. Can I just add to that, they, in addition to what Anna said, they also got the report in um, COBUS's final report today. Today? Today, this morning. Publicly available on the website yeah. and well publicised on Wednesday or Thursday. That's right. Okay. Um, one thing we heard consistent, consistently from um, the submitters at public forum was around the safety um, and basically the accidents and the harm. And obviously we acknowledge that Frederick Street, Pitt Street, London, George Street intersection, the 5 intersection is a dangerous intersection. But when we look at the rest of George Street and when we look at this, the work that we're discussing, um, is two-way or one-way going to make, make it, uh, is one going to have a, a bigger safety, safety advantage over the other? And I note that there was um, data talking about pedestrian activity went from 77.5% down to 65% from one-way to two-way and things like that. Yeah, it's not my field of expertise, but I think if you ask the traffic safety engineer, they would say yes, and there is a prescribed methodology um, that you work through for Waka Katohi funding uh, and uh, it is my expectation that would show that there are safety benefits for having one way um, above that of a two way. Okay, um, and part of Mr Mentz's presentation to councillors, he talked about um, the loop bus and whether it's one way or two way. Um, and actually how that would, his proposal, his thought process was that would stop in lane and that people would hop, on, hop, on, hop off and hop on and then it would move on. So essentially it would, in some most cases, regulate the speed of the traffic anyway on that basis. Correct. So when, I, I guess I'm trying to get a formation in my mind about when we start bringing all those safety pieces together, because I heard loud and clear, safety is a key priority and status quo is not an option, is where are we going with that basis? And, I'm, and, and again, I'm sort of trying to, I don't have a clear picture as you can tell. No, agreed, and sorry, I probably can't provide you with a level of detail that you're looking for, but I can get um, one of our traffic safety engineers to give you that clarity outside of this, if you like. But regardless whether it's one way or two way, um, and the proposed speed limit on George Street 30 k's or is 30 k's um, would actually slow down dramatically based on the loop bus going one way or two way. Yeah, correct. Okay. Councillor Elder. Um, given that five way intersection is a bit of a issue. Um, is there the possibility of um, having a, a stopping of one side so that under the two-way system you've still got that safety related to, to that? I don't know. Are there other ways of, of dealing with that issue? That's what I'm asking. I'm sorry, of the bus stopping, is it? No, no, oh. just a, a way of dealing with that intersection to make it safer under oh. the two-way option. That's what uh, I'm saying. Yes, well, um, 
uh, Mr Menzies' report kind of alludes to some of those options. Yes. Um, the, the most extreme being sever one of the other in, uh, roads coming in, or there are a number of banning right turn uh, um, movements, um, um, speed bumps at the intersection, barns, dances, but th they'll all have an impact on the efficiency of that intersection. The, it's particularly coming down Pitt Street. Correct, yeah. Um, now, the other question I have is um, around Cobus Mints and um, what he said about um, safety in the streets. And I hadn't actually thought about it until I went to pick up my international student at 8 o'clock at night one night. And it was dark, and there was just no one on George Street. And I, th I thought to myself, why is that? Because normally there used to be, because I don't go to George Street very often shopping. Um, the, but the thing is, I realised that, in fact, people waiting for buses populate George Street. And so one of um, my questions is, having that bus going up and down George Street, will that increase the safety of George Street? That's what I'm asking. Long question. Well, the, the theory behind crime prevention through environmental design, well, the, the, the one that's being discussed is around passive surveillance. And so basically, the more people that you have, the more safe people feel, as long as the people that are around them are reasonably well behaved. And you've heard um, discussions of when the behavior of the people that are there is, is, is not um, well behaved, that it can actually not do that, have that effect. But generally speaking, the more people that are there, the safer that you feel because you, you feel that if something went wrong, there would be somebody that you could flag for help. And that's, it's a very simple way of thinking about things. Um, conversely, my students use the bus hub and say because of the numbers of people there, they feel safer. So would you say that would indicate, um, you know, that safety factor? Yes, you want to have people that are present, that are people that you deem as trustworthy and that are not people that are there to harass you, but are there that you could seek help from. And usually people waiting for a bus, I would say, would fall into that category. Most of the time. Is there a melee? The designs of either one or two way have no curbs on them. so. They are more or less by design a shared space street, is that correct? So what's the normal speed limit on such a street? 10 kilometres an hour. Yeah, so, so people have mentioned 30, but in fact these would be 10k streets, right? Correct. Um, on some earlier designs of the one-way option, there was a cycleway, it has some name, because it was cycleway and mobility devices that could go in the opposite direction in those designs, but they're not really sitting on these designs. And I, is that because they would end up being in the detailed business case later? And that's so. This is just really only talking about the direction of traffic, but not necessarily things like an additional bike lane and stuff like that. Yeah, correct. My my take is that this is the principles of the design. What are the trade-offs? And I guess, again, to something that's come up a few times, and it's sometimes presented as an if, and, or, is, is if you were to want a bus going on George Street, it's sort of been presented in these papers that then you would need two-way street. But if you had a small bus, one that was just over, say, two metres wide or so, that was specially built for being on this environment, theoretically, then you would potentially be able to put it, if, if the NZTA allowed you to occupy that thing in a cycleway, and there was a cycleway there, that it could be going up that way and then back down on the road. Yeah, I'd say it's not inconceivable. Yeah, so it doesn't, I mean, I know I've reached it a couple of times, but it does not preclude a bus, a bus service on there if you had the right bus on there, um, if we were to go to a one-way system. And everybody did their right thing, yeah. It's the Raddick. Um, has there been any investigation of the Pitt Street mitigations suggested by Dr. Mill or Cobus Mintz? Oh, there's been an, a lot of discussion on that intersection during the indicative business case, but the, um, 
the further detail to come in the detailed business case. And, and I guess we need the direction from council about what George Street looks like, and then that will um, drive the options that we can look at to um, mitigate safety issues at the intersection. And, and it seems to me um, that the, uh, the people in that survey conducted by Dr. Mintz or Cobus Mintz, um, the business community was overwhelmingly in favour of a two-way. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Well, uh, that's what appeared to be so. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Lord. Simon, I'm just not sure, but it was uh, referred in the uh, public forum by the, I think it was the university people, that um, we were falling behind compared with other uh, main, well, compared with other towns generally. Um, when Jill said, can you give an example, the question was almost every other town in New Zealand. I just wondered, I felt that was perhaps a wee bit harsh, uh, not harsh as in the statement, but I just didn't know if it was quite accurate. Would you, would you say that our urban design is, is behind the rest of the country significantly? Well, it doesn't have to be Simon, sorry if Anna. I, I think um, there was a unanimous view that work needed to be done on George Street, that it wasn't up to scratch, and um, so I think that was a shared view across all the stakeholders. The only thing that's being, that was, um, there were differences of opinion on were whether um, to, to do that upgrade in the context of a two-way slow vehicle movement or one-way. There, there's, I guess there's been a lot of attention um, brought on to the differences in opinion, but actually there was a lot of consensus as well um, amongst the stakeholders around the need to upgrade and bring George Street up to scratch. So I would say that um, that would be a view that's widely held. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The first one probably for the Chief Executive, actually. Um, but. Uh, Dr. Johnson, you have just said that the, you've referred to the unanimity around the need to get it, do some work. Um, I think it would be fair to say that the reason for the condition of a lot of the paving and street works and so on has been a lack of maintenance over the years, not a criticism of everyone, anyone present. Um, so I wanted to ask the Chief Executive if, um, we can be assured that budgets for an appropriate level of maintenance to maintain uh, and ensure the continued good condition of whatever it is we put in place in George Street will be included for our discussion at the end of the year and in the 10-year plan budgets. They will. Thank you. Um, my second question follows on from um, the question about safety. Um, can, and I don't want to talk about design, but can we be assured that as design for whatever configuration proceeds, that appropriate levels of priority will be given to the maintenance of good light, good under veranda lighting, uh, bollards if necessary and so on. Colleagues may not be aware that the bollards currently in place were introduced after the fact because a lot of shopkeepers were turning off their lights in the evening and reducing the amount of safety in the street. Is that a fair assumption that that is going to happen? Uh, yes, lighting came up um, through the engagement strongly across the board and I think needs to be a part of the design. It was also recommended in the peer review. Um, and in terms of the bollards, do you mean the ones on the on the side? In the pavements. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think those would be reviewed in the design, whether they're necessary or not. I don't know if they're as necessary in, in, in the oh. type of shared street environment, but certainly um, the other aspect I mentioned before about having some sort of retractable bollards or some way of closing the street also came through strongly across the board as something that would be great to see in the final design. Thank you. And the final part of that at the moment is that would it be your view, either of you, that, um, that 
the council's efforts to encourage and support further con residential conversion in the inner city, particularly in the immediate CBD, is only a positive in terms of more people dwelling in the area and increasing that passive security that you alluded to earlier. Absolutely. Um, having people in the inner city is not only good for passive surveillance, it's also really good to have a, a nighttime economy. And a number of people have commented on how quiet George Street can get in the in the evening, and and you really want to have a you know a nighttime economy, and having people living in the city will help that. Okay, thank you. Okay, I was critiqued earlier by the mayor for numbering the amount of people who wanted to to to, to speak, and I'm coming to the end of that numbering system. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, I I'm pretty sure I didn't see it anywhere in this paper, but. Um, and forgive me if I did, and I've just forgotten, but I don't see any feedback from the emergency services. Uh, yes, they were, they're involved um, in the Central City <coughs> Advisory Group, mainly from the point of view of fire, and, um, and I do think um, there needs to be some more engagement with police as well. So, that, so I, f I felt like the fire service was well represented, but... Um, I think there's some issues with design that they, they need to be involved with the design process moving forward because they are really critical to get every single design element right in terms of fire appliances, emergency vehicles and policing. Yeah, I, and that's what, um, there was nothing in this report referencing them. And, you know, yes, they had been on the Centre City, Centre City group, but no direct report from them or commentary from them. Uh, they did give... The representative um, uh, from the fire service, I believe, did respond to the questionnaire. Um, but I think their interests really are best um, brought through the detailed design because it's their, their concerns are about getting the details right. And so their primary feedback is make sure you engage with us moving forward, which we definitely need to do. So for them, you believe it doesn't matter whether it's one way or two way? I believe they need to be involved in the detailed business case to ensure that whatever design solution can um, deliver on their needs. So far, they haven't said that a one way system can't do that, but they need to be involved um, moving forward. Okay. Um, the other question, you, you sent out the survey. Um, and I note um, I got it by email um, as a member of the Centre City uh, group, and, and um, I don't believe I responded to it, but the four councillors on the group actually would have received or p participated in that process or could have participated in that process that um, was circulated. Um. As I just want to clarify, can didn't. I speak to who no. hasn't responded? I mean, I know we said we wouldn't put in the public arena what anyone said, but I think, is it fair to say who's responded? Or, I, I, well, I... We did have, we did have, the, the questionnaire did um, ask people if they were okay if we shared what they said, but in the end we made the call not to share it because... Um, just um, to give people a, sort of a, a safer feeling of being able to express their views without being scrutinized. Um, but in terms of who responded, I wasn't aware that the councillors were sent the questionnaire, but we did not receive no, any just, responses from councillors. It was just councillors. the councillors on the group. No, we didn't receive any. Yeah, no. I didn't respond. Yeah. No, they, I think they understood that the purpose of the questionnaire was for the other advisory group members. No, no, all good, okay. There we go. Thank you. I think that's been clearly answered. Okay, it seems that it does prove that numbering systems do have some validity. Um, earlier, of course, Mayor Hawkins has indicated his willingness to move option two, which I'm happy to second, and I presume Lauren's going to put that on the screen shortly. Um, would you like to speak to it? Yeah, I would, thank sure. you. Um, and uh, for me, it's reasonably straightforward uh, supporting the one-way option as the, as the 
as the primary starting point, um, and the report makes that fairly clear, as has been summarised uh, at length by some of our, or one of our presenters um, during the public forum. This is the option uh, that gets us the better safety outcomes. It's the option that gets us uh, the better public amenity outcomes, and more importantly, uh, in these uh, straightened times, the option that's more likely to attract uh, external funding for this work. And as uh, Ms O'Brien pointed out uh, in her uh, deputation um, all those um, hours ago, uh, this is uh, what aligns with the government policy statement on transport and, and the priorities that are coming out of, of Waka Kotaki in an environment where they uh, aren't quite as flush as they have been in recent times. The best that we can do is to align the work that we're doing with what they are, uh, what they are prioritising. Uh, but when it comes to thinking about decisions like this, I think it's important for us to focus on in whose interests these decisions are being made in the long term. Uh, and in particular, uh, in, in this example, uh, thinking about who is excluded uh, by the status quo, and we've heard plenty on that um, earlier today, around mostly around accessibility, whether you have uh, mobility issues or whether you have uh, young families or whether you are pedestrians. Uh, the, the status quo uh, isn't something that encourages people to come into the city centre, and that is a huge uh, missed opportunity that we have uh, the opportunity to, uh, to, to remedy. Um, I, I welcomed the peer review and I think a lot of really good stuff has come out of it, particularly around uh, the discussion around the, the, the clutter of the urban design as proposed, the challenges around the severance uh, with the con conflicting uh, one ways, uh, the, the connection to the octagon from a legibility point of view, um, all, uh, all uh, solid uh, feedback that we will certainly take on board as we go through the detailed design phase and, and the, the attendant budget processes. Uh, but ultimately, uh, Mr Mentz's peer review says that both of the options, option one and option two, are both viable uh, depending on how you want your bus, um, bus loop to look and how you want that to function. Uh, and I've always been supportive of the, the, the city centre bus loop as a trial, and it was always designed to be a trial. Ideally, it would have happened earlier, uh, at a point at which it could have better designed, better informed the discussion that we're having today. But we uh, we don't currently uh, have that luxury. And the more I think about it, uh, the more I think it, it is something that is best considered uh, within the wider context of the public transport system. Uh, and, and that is best dealt with through the regional public transport plan uh, that the ORC are running early next year and, and reviewing, uh, rather than us trying to bolt something on uh, to, to that network, um, which I think uh, wouldn't get us uh, the best options. Uh, but I think ultimately we should be ambitious about how we want our city centre to function uh, and, and, and fix and resolve the issues that might come out of the decisions that the decision we're about to make today. Um, because I think they are solvable, and I, f I struggle to believe and I fail to understand how we could be the one city in the entire uh, developed world who cannot make uh, pedestrian-friendly spaces in their city centre work. I mean, that's not the kind of exceptionalism that I think any of us uh, have in mind when we talk about um, the, the capacity that we have uh, in the city. Uh, in the current global public health context, I think the New Zealand as a country and Dunedin um, as a as a location and certainly within our our region uh, is very well positioned in terms of attracting uh, talent um, as as expats return home from uh, less stable environments and the kinds of things that we can do as a council and as a city uh, from an economic development point of view and from a social well-being point of view uh, are, are invest in the kinds of things that those people expect to see in a 21st century city, and that is a city centre that is uh, working backwards from being people friendly rather than being something that is focused on the throughput or worse, uh, the private or the public storage of privately owned uh, motor vehicles as the, as the number one priority. Um, and this is a, a step in that direction. The, it's important to note, and a lot has been mentioned of the survey of which 35 people received it and 17 people responded, but the, the public engagement and, and debate around this has been going for close to a decade now. Uh, it was um, exhaustive and, and we came to decisions as a council as a result of the particular focus on the George Street retail quarter uh, and, and um, 
as a result of external pr pressure, find ourselves in the situation we are, where we are revisiting it. And I think we have ended up, as frustrating as it is, uh, to have delayed the work as often as we have. I think we do. We have ended up with uh, with a better outcome uh, as a, as a result of that. But only uh, this option uh, would deliver us uh, with that with that better outcome. Uh, we talk a lot at length as a body about how we as a city want to attract and retain uh, people, with either graduates from the university or the polytech or people returning from, well, overseas experiences which are somewhat curtailed in the current environment. And we've had heard loud and clear at our public forum before this meeting exactly what those people expect their city to do uh, and, f and how they expect their city to function. It, it would be uh, empty rhetoric uh, on, on, on our part to then turn around at this point uh, and refuse uh, to, to deliver on uh, exactly the kinds of things that make it easier for the city to attract and retain uh, our young people. Uh, we have an obligation under the purpose of the Local Government Act to consider uh, the four well-beings, environmental, cultural, economic and social well-being, and op this option uh, provides us with ample opportunity to deliver on all of those. Um, we've made a commitment through, whether it's through the, the Global Street Design Guide or the, the higher level strategic documents that Council has prepared, you know, we've made a commitment that uh, the streets of our city centre are primarily for people. Uh, and that we want our city centre to function as a destination uh, and not a thoroughfare. As I said, this is the best option we have presented to us uh, that contributes to uh, those desired outcomes. Uh, it's a step in the right direction. There's a lot of detail to be worked through, but let's get on with working through the detail that will get us the best outcome uh, rather than this per perpetual cycle of relitigating the debate about uh, whether our city centre should prioritise people or uh, private motor vehicles. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Uh, 15 seconds of your five minutes, which, which I'll, I'll, I'll grant. I'll, I'll, is it 10 minutes? Oh, there you go. You've got four, 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 four minutes, 45 left. Uh, Councillor Vandervoos. I was quite pleased to read the recommendations and note that I could happily agree with two of them, A and C. We can note the findings, that's absolutely fine, and we can revoke the preliminary design. Regarding the options for B, however, all of them basically give us the choice, if you can call it a choice, to either proceed or to continue. I don't believe proceeding or continue actually uh, gives us any options at all. And I have been astounded at the claims of the unanimous, although it's anonymous, uh, um, uh, view that work needed to be done in George Street um, by uh, the group that Dr Johnson uh, referred to with the 17 respondents. If we are to look at consultation, then we have to look, I believe, at the many submissions that we had at the time of the annual plan. The most submissions we had were on the rates, 200 of them, most wanting a zero rates, which we ignored. The next most submitted on issue was the central city plan. And by far the majority of 172 submissions were that we simply do not proceed, that it gets shelved. So the idea that we have consulted and that the consultation result is that we have to go ahead with this and we have an agenda in front of us which tells us we have to proceed or continue flies directly in the face of the real consultation that we had at annual plan time. This latest uh, Cobus Mens, um, yet another consultant uh, brought in, um, is something which I believe uh, wasn't warranted. I think that the uh, uh, Central City Advisory Group, in terms of its setup and in terms of what it's come up with, doesn't represent what the people of Dunedin actually want and that there have been a, a very large number of misconceptions thrown out, um, quite recently some of them. One of them is that we have the uh, choice between George Street being a destination 
or a thoroughfare. This is not a choice. We currently have both. George Street currently provides a very significant north-south two-way traffic for a very large number of uh, um, road users. And they're not just cars, there's people in those cars. I'm talking about the people of Dunedin and how they choose to travel. And they choose to travel in, in, in such a vast majority in cars that the uh, submitters that we heard of earlier today uh, represent a tiny minority of the people that we are supposed to represent. We need desperately the north-south traffic thoroughfare that we have in George Street. And we're going to need it even more when the ill-considered uh, site for the hospital ends up making even more of a mess of the one-way street system than it is already. If you look at other situations where pedestrianisation has been uh, tried, and you've got to remember that what's currently in front of us is the nearest thing to pedestrianisation that Cobus Men's would allow as possible. This is still pedestrianisation and drag, I see it, with uh, just one, one way of, uh, of traffic. Um, if you look at pedestrianisation as happened in Christchurch Square, what that did for crime and what that did for people's security was turn the centre of Christchurch into a glue sniffers assembly place. It drove all the character and the uh, opportunities for normal people to actually visit the centre of Christchurch, it drove them out and turned it into a wasteland of sticky plastic bags. If you look at the security issues that have been experienced by Ipswich and Norwich in the UK 20 years ago when they pedestrianised their main streets, you will realise that their crime issues spiked, that the claim that the nighttime economy necessary for security uh, was actually uh, improved, the ex exact opposite was the case. The lack of cars going through their main streets meant that females in particular wouldn't walk them in the evening. There was no nighttime economy that resulted, and there's been a strong call to bring cars back to the centres. Uh, main streets of both Ipswich and Norwich, both of which are university towns in the UK of roughly Dunedin's population of about 130,000. So the proposal today that we approve proceeding, that we approve continuing with a one way for George Street, when we still have no significant north-south traffic modelling, is something which I cannot countenance. When this whole issue was first put in front of us, over a year ago now, the first question was, what are you going to do about the north-south traffic modelling problem? And it was, we were told then, oh, that hasn't been modelled yet, but we have a plan for George Street. There's been lots of discussion around the table today about having a holistic view and being able to look at what's good for everybody. In fact, what this motion in front of us does is it ignores the holistic issues of traffic, especially north-south in Dunedin. It ignores the fact that getting more people into the centre of the city will invariably be people that come in by car. If not 90%, then probably 95%. If you want more people to come into the centre of the city, cars are how they travel. Now, you may not like the fact that they travel that way because of your car phobia or because they are fossil fuelled, but that is what the situation is. And in the future, as electric vehicles become more diverse, and there's a far greater range of them, electric vehicles of all sizes, from skateboards through to... Um, you know, uh, Nissan Leafs, whatever, are going to be the way people access the centre of the city. We have to have north-south traffic movement, we have to have a, a, a potential for parking, and we have to recognise also that the kind of massive spend that was pushed pre-COVID and has been pushed through COVID and is now being pushed against 
the vast majority of the submitters to the annual plan, that massive $60 million spend for surface treatments, Councilor nothing Vanderbus, to do with the required Councilor infrastructure. Vanderbus, you have got a wee bit of time, but I'm happy to let you wrap up if you can do that fairly quickly. Okay. The, the cost of what is being proposed here, like the modelling, has simply not been looked at. We have to recognise that we can't afford to do this financially. We have to recognise that we can't afford to do this in terms of disruption to traffic. And we have to recognise that the majority of submitters to the annual plan don't want us to go here. Those are just some of the reasons why you should be voting against this motion. Thank you for indulging me. I, uh, I, I wind up. Uh, Councillor Hulan. Thank you, Chair. Firstly, I want to say that this is a very controversial issue. Um, it's affected us as a council really almost most of the year. And it has divided us as a council. And that's something you saw earlier that I was a bit emotional about, actually, which surprised me. But one of the main reasons I was feeling a bit emotional was that I let myself down and I snapped at a councillor who I really respect and I apologise for that again. Now I feel emotional again. <laughs> but uh, it is an emotional issue because we're affecting people's lives and it is everyday people that are affected and I also felt emotional, I must... I was going to say, it must be time of month, that's not appropriate, is it? But it's not. <laughs> Sorry, that's so inappropriate. But um, what, what also made me feel emotional is that when one of the submitters sitting down here in the public forum said that anyone who votes for two-way um, you know, traffic is voting against the climate and climate change. Now, I strongly, strongly really object to that because I am one of the biggest things for our city, for our nation, for the world in my opinion is climate change and that's one of the biggest things for me and for my children and sustainability. That's why I did a paper on sustainability for my masters. That's also why we sent our kids to an environmental school. That's why I look at all the wrappings and all the things. I have read the documentation that Professor Nathan Berg put there, and I've looked at it, I've weighed everything up. All, and I've listened to um, Cobus, who has talked about the flexibility of this design. Um, what, what for me has made me really concerned about it is that we could actually increase our carbon emissions if we look at doing one way or pedestrianising the whole area. And that is because it will affect the traffic flow. Now that concerns me. The other thing that concerns me, and Councillor Vandervis raised it as well, is that, um, you know, these are people who use their car. There's thousands of people in our city right now who drive a car. Now, I agree with uh, many of us who I would like to see a lot of those cars off the road. That is not going to happen yet because we don't have a good public transport system. I think if we get a really good loop bus, that could definitely help. But the loop bus is not going to straight away just work on its own. We need a transport hub. That's going to take years to, to come to fruition, whether it does or not. We also need to look at how we haven't done the modelling, so we don't know the effects of what's going to happen with the hospital build. I know for a fact there are hundreds of people at the moment who are put out because we're um, sealing the St Andrew Street car park. Now they're everyday people who've come in who park there who now cannot find a park. I know one person who paid $24 for one day to park in a car park building. Now why I'm talking about this is because it is relevant. People right now cannot get around the city. When we talk about the well-being of our people in the city, we have to look at projects like this and these will cause major disruption to the people in our city. The reasons are that one, the flow will be affected of the traffic, um, the way people can get around, we've talked about, Cobus mentioned the safety because there's not going to be as many people driving through those streets. There's also not going to, there's, there's, it's making it difficult for a, a loop bus to go around the streets. 
Um, but, you know, without the modelling, I cannot see how we can make an informed decision here today. I also have, unfortunately and sadly, I have to say, I am not surprised we have this motion on the table. And the reason I say that is that right at the start of this process, we said we had concerns about it. Then, all of a sudden, it was suggested by Councillor Benson Pope that we'd have a central city advisory group. I praised that. I thought that was an excellent idea for engagement. Now, we've gone through that process, and I think COBUS did some excellent engagement. I was very impressed. Now, he has come back, and the staff have come back, with option one being a two-way street. The majority of the groups that were represented on that central city advisory group all said, the majority of them who voted, said and took part that they wanted it to be two-way. Some of the major reasons during a COVID time as well is that businesses will be adversely affected. That's what COBA says in his report, if we take away two-way traffic from the street. Now, this is our CBD. This is the vibrancy, the buzz of our city where people do retail. Now, those businesses that have already been hit by COVID are going to be hit again if we do this. So I want people to really seriously think before you vote about the well-being of all the people in our city, not just some groups, but look, also we have to think of climate change, we have to think of carbon emissions, and that's, you know, I just can't see how we could vote any other way. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Houlihan. I'm so glad you don't have a disposable cup in front of you as well after your speech on the environment. Um, I also just want to point out, I granted you the same courtesy as Councillor Vandervis, and I'm happy to continue with that. Uh, Councillor Reddick. Thank you. Um, I ask, what is George Street all about? And it's about shops and shoppers, and the stakeholders and those have asked overwhelmingly for a two-way. They do want to have George Street done up, and one imagines that they're prepared to um, pay the price. But uh, one of those people, representing the stakeholders in the uh, Central City Advisory Group, represents over 6,500 shoppers. Others represented most of the George Street property owners, and others represented well over 40 George Street businesses. And they called overwhelmingly for a two-way setup. And that's because they are well aware that the majority of people come to George Street to shop in a car. Now, it's fair enough that we are aiming for a transition away from uh, that, that transportation device as our main thing. But in the meantime, everybody, the majority of people are still using cars and need to be catered for if we're going to ensure the viability of those businesses on George Street. And with it, the lives and livelihoods of a great many people. And we talk about the well-beings, the four well-beings, but the economic and social well-being of Dunedin, the right at the heart of it, is very much a part and parcel of what we're talking here. To retain the economic viability of George Street should be a significant concern for us as we consider this, because a great many, there are hundreds of jobs, a great many people's lives and livelihoods are at stake. One of the things that Cobus mentioned is that all around the world, pedestrianised streets are being reopened for cars. It is very easy to get this wrong. He mentioned that there's a whole industry in Australia de-pedestrianising streets. In New Zealand, we have the example of Tauranga, Hamilton, Petone, and a particular Onehunga to look at. So there are many streets in Dunedin that have been pedestrianised and are rolling back. So as those streets have turned into wastelands of uh, non-activity and businesses closed down, we've already got enough trouble in George Street. So shutting it down to one way uh, is what the people on George Street are particularly, they're very scared about that. They're particularly worried. The, similarly, effective shopper transport runs in both, both directions all around the world. So if we're going to have public transport running up and down that street, uh, carting people from one end to the other, it runs most effectively in both directions 
And similarly, having it go in both directions slows the traffic down because if they're going to get people down to 10 kilometres an hour, it's a very difficult thing to enforce. You're going to have, to have policemen on that street the whole time. And as we've already seen, that's not a viable alternative. But having a loop bus going, going up and down the street will enable frequent and convenient movement for shoppers the length of the street. So it is far better to start with a two-way in the first instance and retain maximum flexibility. I note the um, CCS submissions. All of their desires are catered for in a two-way system other than the fact that they would prefer one way. And in particular, the safety angles, because of course we're talking shop to shop and an even surface, an even shared surface. So, but safety is a major, major consideration, not only for the physical safety of people on wheels, but the presence of traffic. As Cobus was at great pains to point out, that contributes greatly to nighttime safety, and we have the Ipswich and Norwich. Similarly, to demonstrate the, um, the lack of safety when traffic is removed completely. So the thing with that at George Street Advisory Group, it did incorporate a heck of a lot, thousands of our ratepayers into the consultative process, whereas the original consultation that came out with the two-way split design, the one-way split design, only had 1,200, only um, surveyed 1,200 representatives. So the 6,500 shoppers that um, one, of our, one of the George Street Advisory Group uh, representatives or uh, panellists represented covers a heck of a lot of pedestrians on that street. So uh, I was, I, uh, the critical thing with the two-way, it gives you maximum flexibility, it gives you 65% pedestrianisation, two-thirds instead of three-quarters, 75 the other way, and it provides reassurance to the shoppers, the businesses, the property owners, and all pedestrians in Dunedin. Similarly, the safety. So it sends a signal to all parties that their voices have been heard because they certainly did not feel they were heard in the original consultation. So Cobus Mintz emphasised it's very easy to get things wrong. I urge councillors to go with the staff recommended option, uh, which I foreshadow as a motion, uh, and I urge councillors to decline option B, option A and C, uh, as mentioned by another councillor, uh, perfectly acceptable, but option B, the one way, is not the way to start. We're better to go with the flexible two way, which I foreshadow is a motion to follow should that fail. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, me allowing councillors to go over five minutes doesn't mean you have to take it. Uh, councillor Barker. Thank you, Chair. Like others, I've been torn on what the vision and solution for George Street should be and how to ensure we enable an economically strive, thriving, thriving, strong, thriving retail quarter where people love to visit, the heart of our city. Today we've heard OUSA giving us a serve about changing our minds and OK Boomers, listen to the future moment, to stick to the consulted on decision around a one way plus a plea to future proof the design. We've heard CCS and DPA talk to us about excess issues, making a destination not a thoroughfare, and to consider the original community cons consultation as well. Generation Zero gave a great analysis of the options and urged us to put people first. Another 35 groups have been able to engage through the Centre City Advisory Group, and we have just shy of 50%, 17 of them, responding via the Cobus Mintz questionnaire, which I felt was a little disappointing as it was anonymised. I haven't quite understood if all of the groups were fairly represented and thus haven't felt able to give it full weight. We had a petition signed by 6,000 people led by retailers around retaining the two-way on George Street. We also have the background of the consultation previous to the Council decision on George Street of June 2019. These are people who will also be helping to pay for this upgrade, using this space and experiencing repercussions and benefits from our decisions, affecting their full well-beings, as the Mayor and Councillor Reddick have alluded to earlier, that as Council we are charged by Government to have at the heart of our decision making. All of these people's voices have been heard, along with the experts' reports that we've been given this year, and it's up to us as councillors to listen, intellectually and passively analyse, and to make a decision for the benefit of all Dunedin people. I'm not a retail expert, but I want to focus on and quote from the extremely robust and considered expert retail first report presented to Councillor May, 
which stated that Dunedin's retail quarter's performance lags regional and national trends, indicating localised issues with improvement and increasing necessity for the city. Spending grew just 1.07% in 2019. At the same time, Otago experienced the highest online sales growth in New Zealand. Footfall across a range of key sites dropped during 2019, some months reaching 20% less consumers entering stores. This challenges the economic value of the area. Apparel shopping has declined 5.8% over three years. Spend on experiences and ho hospitality has increased over 22%. The report goes on to say, the success of Dunedin's emerging contemporary destinations, such as the Warehouse Precinct, is closely related to their cafes, bars and restaurants. This indicates need and value in developing similar on-trend environments and experiences in the retail quarter. Increasingly, Dunedin's more popular consumer destinations are evolving outside the quarter and include independent and artisanal influence that differentiates and attracts consumers. I consider we do need to make a strong change to create the vibrant area that people want to visit. The Retail First report also states, it is important the retail quarter responds with transformative spaces and experiences that reflect social and environment objectives while also supporting future economic opportunity. I consider the important word here is transformative. Plus the report says, Streetscapes enabling greater walkability encourage discovery, while environments that increase dwell time, social opportunities and contemporary dining experiences support economic, environmental and social benefit. It goes on to talk about mo modern environments that people gravitate to and become destinations of choice and pride. And the years ahead will be characterised by business adaptation, agility, greater openness and the appetite to try new ways of inspiring and engaging consumers. Audacious efforts may be necessary in encouraging people back into shops and cafes and spending again. This provides a window of opportunity in which to collaboratively shape the quarter's physical experience and deliver those alongside the changes that business and property owners will also need to make. Dunedin should not emerge from this unprecedented economic event expecting success by delivering the same consumer experiences as it has done. The community will be expectant for improvements in environment proposition and culture. Uh, I can hear the beeper going. The different. Oh, okay, excellent. Other research looking at pedestrianisation and retail also states driving to a store by car is not the common understanding of convenience anymore. The new convenient is getting the product delivered to the doorstep. Retailers need to attract their customers by offering a unique experience that online shopping can't offer. This is only possible by adding a social component to the shopping experience, creating a local hub and a space for human interaction. In Mr Mintz's report, it states that if the provision of vehicle movement overrides the placemaking objectives, the benefits of attracting and engaging a range of users, including visitors and the young, and providing a platform for contemporary and cultural expressions may never occur. This may result in stagnation and a lost opportunity, and thus he encourages flexibility. In my opinion, the differences between option one and option two, one way versus two way, primarily to seem to be about buses, <laughs> pedestrian percentages and safety at George and Frederick Street, which has been noted as one of the most dangerous intersections in New Zealand. I actually have been hit by a cyclist at that very intersection. Plus, larger amounts of the streets would be available for placemaking. Option two delivers higher pedestrian percentage opportunities, plus increased intersection safety with possible access to NZTA funding, increased people placemaking opportunities, and I believe that option gives us a better opportunity for creating an exciting destination for all our Dunedin people and visitors. As the Mayor referred to, our central city plan has been over a decade in the meeting, making it's time to make a decision and move on. Option two would be the most transformative way to help us create a new vision for a thriving retail quarter, and thus I support an opportunity for a bolder change with the added bonus of a flexible design. That's a long 60 seconds. Um, Councillor Elder. Thank you very much. Um, I won't be supporting this option. Um, and I want to talk about um, transition. I think society is in a transition. I think we are transitioning to a lower carbon um, footprint. We're, we're looking at a lot of transitions. But when we have transitions, we need to take the people with us. 
And sometimes we need to do things slower and give the opportunity to experiment with spaces so that people can see what the be benefits of those transitions can be. And that is why I'm opting for option one. I traverse the, um, the, the first question, first reason I'm going for option one is I used to drive the buses, I used to drive the Norman B St Clair bus and in fact it was the most profitable bus in the whole of the city, it was the only one that made a profit. Why? Because it took people from one end to the other both ways and so it enabled more people to access the centre city. One of the things that has come back to me through feedback through um, both the disability community and the older community around the bus hub has been it has, it has actually reduced their ability to access that area. Now to ha having driven the buses um, and watched passengers' behaviour, um, people don't tend to want to take a bus in one single loop one way. They don't want to go around a whole circuit to get to the same point because it takes a lot of time. So I believe we need a two-way option if we're going to look at this. The other side of it is, depending on the loop we take, the fact is we could actually reduce the number of people who take cars. Just imagine if we went past the university. Just imagine if people could get off, get off the bus at um, the central city hub and get back into town because a lot of people are finding that really difficult. The other thing is that a lot of um, people with mobi mobility issues actually drive to down because of their mobility issues. And we have to take account of that. And a number of people have said that very thing, we need to have those disability parks, we need to have those P20, P30s to enable that access. For me, um, I think this consultation has um, brought out a whole lot of solutions to some of the issues. And in fact, someone said, we actually agree on most of those. And some of the solutions um, that came out of those options um, would actually address some of those things. But my alarm was, a, <laughs> my alarm happened um, about this, because I was just keeping an open mind, and I've driven the buses, but I went to pick up my student at eight o'clock, and there was no one on George Street. And I thought to myself, oh, why is that? And um, I realised, having driven the buses, there's lots of queues. <laughs> There's lots of queues for buses, so after work, um, after shopping, um, there are a lot of people on the street waiting for the bus. And that creates a lot of safety. And in fact, the funny thing is, my students say they feel safe in the bus hub because in fact, those very people are there. Um, and I believe having a safe and vibrant street is really, really important when it comes to accessibility. But also, I believe this design gives us a, the opportunity to trial new things and help people transition into the future. So starting with two-way enables that by both ways bus, enables safety at night, which I really am quite concerned about, um, and enables better access for a lot of people. Um, that, that two-way bus um, thing. But the other thing is we have to take into um, account the concerns of uh, the, um, our police, our um, ambulance, our safety people. We have to take into account the concerns of the retailers who see so many retail areas going ahead with parking areas. And so if we can take people on a journey and start with option two and play around and experiment with all the other correlations that we can further down the track, we are providing um, a safety net for the future but also enabling a just, as um, Generation said, 
Zero said, an ethical transition to carbon zero, and we have to listen to our people. Thank you. Closest to five minutes yet. Um, Councillor Laufiso. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I would just like to quote a proverb that's often um, misused, or the context is often misused, and, uh, to talk about the present generation. So, he aha te mea nui o te ao, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. And most people talk about when they say, what is the most important thing in the world? It is people, it is people, it is people. And they actually, when people often quote that, they, they're actually talking about the current living generations. But in actual fact, um, I uh, just want to acknowledge uh, various tangata who have made comments um, on this uh, whakatauki. And they're actually saying that the first person to use this, um, Mary Ngaroto, Rangatira, uh, 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 wahine from Ngāpuhi was actually talking about generations yet unborn. So for me, this whole debate, and I acknowledge the emotion and the passion, and we can quote all the reports that we'd like, but for me, this is about not numbers of people before or after, it's about equity. And so I'd just like to thank all the submitters today who came along to challenge us because as far as I, I'm concerned, uh, I would just like to acknowledge the process that has, as His Worship said, has been in train for a decade. And I want to um, acknowledge in particular Ms. Catherine Ward uh, for all the abuse uh, that she had to put up with as a worker. And so no matter how emotional and passionate you are, there is no excuse for abusing any anyone, let alone a staff member. So I just want to for me, it's in context. We had a process, and as other councillors have said, Mr. Um, Coba Smith's um, involvement in the process is, has been has thrown up a lot of, of good points for consideration. So I just want to acknowledge the staff as well, Dr. Johnson and her team, for. Um, doing as, as uh, council required at annual plan time for bringing, to bringing that peer review in. And I want to just repeat what I said at the time of annual plan. Um, for many of the people I know who don't always go to the high-end retail area, which is George Street, uh, for many reasons, parking is not a key consideration of their lives. Um, they've got far more pressing issues of basic economic survival to, to deal with. And as far as the retailers are concerned, and I've said this in previous debates, yes, the retailers are suffering because of COVID-19, but so have um, Māori and Pacifica in particular, other, other groups and communities have also been suffering long before COVID-19 comes along. So I just want to acknowledge the mover and, and I'll be supporting the motion. Kia ora. Thank you, Councillor Lufiso, and for your pertinent and kind words around Ms Ward. Councillor Staines. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to support these resolutions. I've been reassured today by hearing from staff that having a one-way traffic flow from north to south would provide the best option for improving safety of the five-way intersection at Knox Church Pitt Street, our mo one of our most dangerous intersections. That one way is very likely to provide a greater degree of safety for pedestrians. That it may be possible to run a bus loop service in both directions. And I know that a small 15 to 20 person bus, autonomous electric bus, is running now at Christchurch Airport. And having done a little bit of research on that, you can couple them together and have a 40 seater. It will be no problem to run those autonomous buses both ways. They will fit, they're narrow. Even more reassuring is that if we, and many of our community, find that our preference for the one way is wrong, in spite of all of our efforts, 
which I think is unlikely, or that the traffic modelling shows that a one-way option is not practical, then the design does have the flexibility to be changed. All of these encourage me um, and give me the confidence to vote in favour of what a very large number of our community have told us they want. Yes, there's been a survey, a survey asking people whether they want change. Few people like change. People are scared of change. They, they, you only have to look back at the projects as, that Council has done over the years. And I, I quote, Moana Pool, strong opposition, now loved. Art Gallery, strong opposition, now loved. Stadium, strong opposition, now loved. Yeah, and while, while I, I may not have agreed with the stadium at the time, I concede that it has added a value to the city that you know, is helping our economy, giving people options to see things that they wouldn't have otherwise seen. So, they've all resulted in benefits to the city. I don't want us to be a council that's spineless that does not have the fortitude to make the decision to change. To opt for the new layout to be two-way is to vote for what we have now. We've got it. Yes, there'll be a little bit more space for pedestrians, but do I know which way the car's gonna come and hit me? No. If it's one way, I do. I only have to look one way. We've had plenty of expertise involved. It's unlikely we're going to get this wrong. Yes, retailers will be dead scared, and I don't blame them. They are in a situation where the change is going to affect them most. But my gut feel is that the change will be positive, not negative. It will be seen as negative until it's done, and then it will be seen as positive. And I go back to a saying that Richard Walls always said, the measure of a good decision is actually how long it is before your community agrees that it was a good decision. For Moana Pool, it was a matter of weeks. For the art gallery, it was a matter of days. For the stadium, probably a matter of two or three years. I really believe that we have to adopt change, not take the WIMP option of going two-way, take the one way. We know we can go back if we, we see that it is wrong, and I really doubt that it will be wrong. And let's show our community that we've heard them and help our retailers, hold hands with our retailers to get them through what they see as potentially a negative change. I honestly believe that it will be positive for our retailers. Thank you. I'd just like to raise a point of order. At this point. Sorry, what's the point of order? That the characterisation of WIMP and spineless is inappropriate when we're having a debate about whatever options and casting aspersions at those councillors that would prefer to have a two-way option. I think that's... My, I'm happy to withdraw those yes. words, but it was, it was not it intended was... at councillors who vote against. It was, it was the council as a whole, but I will withdraw. Thank you, Councillor Staines. Thank you, Mr Chair. I want to begin by um, picking up on something that Councillor Staines talked about, and I spoke of it yesterday, and it's relevant to this discussion, and that was how the Peninsula Connection came about. It was slightly different, it was community-led, but people around this table voted against it, and we're in a position now where this council is being praised for having vision. It was 13 or so years in the making. It's caused the community a huge amount of disruption and inconvenience, but because they understand what is at the end of it and the outcome that we're heading for, they have embraced that inconvenience. I see some parallels here. I want to start, though, by talking about the submissions today, and they moved me greatly on a number of levels. They moved me because it was all about people first, um, and I was moved by the fact that the uh, stat of 25% of the population have a disability of some kind. It isn't always a seen thing, uh, and it isn't always somebody in a wheelchair. 
Um, it's much more subtle than that. And I was also reminded uh, of the young people in our community, the 20,000 students, which are often dismissed by our community in a variety of ways. And I appreciated hearing from them because those are the people for whom we are making decisions. Those are the people that will experience uh, the outcomes. I also was moved because I live this every day and you might think that uh, when you consider mobility and those kinds of issue in vulnerable people um, that I'd be opting for uh, two-way. Um, not at all, and I was fascinated by some of the arguments that people put forward, but I listened very, very carefully to Mary O'Brien and Chris Ford on their views and what they talked about in terms of safety. Um, this motion will give more safety for those vulnerable people. And I think about our pedestrian stats, the accident stats, uh, they are nothing less than shameful. And it's a pause for thought. And we don't often consider those stats as individual people. And I've mentioned it before around this table, my mother was somebody who was run over in George Street. It was many years ago but she lived with those lifelong injuries for the whole of her life until she passed away at the age of 87. Let's not dismiss those pedestrian stats uh, because those are people whose lives are affected and they should be central to our decision making. The one way addresses the five way intersection issues and the uh, and the safety issues there, and the slower traffic that the one way will deliver uh, make it safer for everyone. In terms of crime prevention, um, I know that urban design can improve this, and and the one the one thing that I feel anxious about in terms of we need to get on with it is making decisions in other parts of our work around increasing the intensity of people living in the CD, CBD. I was fascinated by people talking about um, the police's view. I recall a conversation I had uh, during the Ed Sheeran concert weekend about the police's view of um, cars, or the absence of cars, uh, in the octagon, and how it was such a relief that there weren't cars there, for example, because that was what exacerbated problems late at night. And I see nods around the table from those who know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so may, make no mistake, public amenity and improved public amenity encourages people. And about getting people out of cars, well if we get people out of cars that can, then those who can't will have more opportunity. And that's in the way of the quick parks and the mobility parks. And I consider the bus loop as being critical to this package that we're discussing today, whether it be integrated with the current bus system or a separate loop. It isn't time for doubting ourselves and hesitating. I believe we're looking in the balance and supporting this motion at all of the people in our city, not just some sectors, but all. And this is about looking to the future. This is about what's good for the most vulnerable will be the best for everybody. It's about an opportunity that we don't want to lose. It's about having vision for the future and it's about being bold and I urge my colleagues to do all of those things today. Take up the opportunity, have the vision, and be bold, and don't second guess yourselves. Thank you, Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I have the um, dubious honour of being two years inside a generational group that allows me to get up in the morning, look in the mirror, and go, OK, boomer. And I have a feeling that much of what we're facing here is a generational split for a vision of the future of the city. The people that came and talked to us this morning that were not part of the disabled groups were in fact all young. They are the ones who are going to pay for this. We know that when we do intergenerational spends, it takes 20 to 30 years to pay that off. That means it's those who are in their 20s now will be in their 40s and 50s and old and withered like me when they get to the end of this. 
can't remember what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> um, so, so the point is, I do believe that their voice is important, and a lot of those engaged in the public consultation process that finished somewhere in about 2017 or so, and they did not understand that we were going back and revisiting this. So therefore, they were largely absent and somewhat silent in this current rejigging re and reassessment. The Central City Advisory Group was a good idea. It was an opportunity to go in and talk one more time. But I, I would go and look at this particular, what's in this report in terms of this feedback form that came back. I was there that night that was handed out. It was not presented as a vote or a referendum. It was an opportunity to feedback to Mr. Mintz what your thoughts were. And to be honest, it was heavily populated by a group that had a singular view, and that's why we're seeing the singular view here. I think it represents what um, a lot of the people who own retail space in Dunedin think about what they want. But remember all the other voices that have been here today. Now, I look at the one-way system and go this one-way option and say this is the nearest thing we can do to a future-focused a future -focused design. We're trying to create a genuinely shared space. But the other point is the second half of option B is that it has the flexibility to go back to a two-way if it turns out to be an abject failure. It will be built, the design of the floor of the road and everything else will allow us to go to a two-way if we have to. But we should try out the most advanced plan first and then go regressive if we find we have to. We can't do it in the other way around. I would also like to point out that cars are not always safe, especially late at night. I myself was a victim of Scarfy bashing. And we had the president of OUSA say that she herself has also been a victim, or at least been on the receiving end of bad behaviour out of cars. The police have commented that every time the car activity is lower in the octagon, so is the crime. So at certain times at night, cars are actually, Councillor Vandervis, they actually did, so I'm glad you'll find the police so funny. So the, I want to talk about traffic flow. and. Um, Firstly, talking about if you're coming in north to south on that five-way intersection at Pitt Street, you're effectively turned it into a four-way intersection. That allows you then to have better light cycles, and that's part of the other thing you'll get, is you'll get better east-west traffic flow at that spot. We have a very good north-south axis, which will not be modified in the immediate term. We, we're going back to consult what we'll do around the hospital later, but it, it's not going to be done at the same time we're doing George Street. It's only two blocks away. George Street, well, it's be two way or one way, is going to go down to 10 kilometres an hour. It is not going to become a thoroughfare street anymore, no matter which direction we choose. We need to make sure we modify those east west movements so we can get traffic in and out of the area. I acknowledge people will come in and out of cars, but I also bought my first road bike last night. I have to go and pay for it still. Um, I also want to say don't conflate the hospital rebuild with this. We've just gone in the middle of the hospital demolition right now. There are significant truck movements in and out of that site now, and yet we're not seeing any major blocks on the system. That will be the same thing during the build. The university's builds have not influenced the one-way system right now, and two very large buildings are being built up there right now. So listen, this is not full pedestrianisation, and some might even say that that itself is a failure that we didn't go that far, but it is a significant step to increasing the livability of the area, and I do this for those who are going to pay for it, and they are younger than me. Thank you. Got some very angry young people sitting behind you. Um, Councillor Wiley, Wiley. This is about our city. It's about all our residents, young and old. You know, whether in Port Chalmers, Portobello, or in Mosgiel, they all enjoy using our city, and they all enjoy using our centre city. The one thing that really I look at is I want to thank Cobus Mintz for the work that he did. And, you know, and praise Council for bringing him in and actually putting a lot of options on the table. I also want to thank the participants of the Centre City Advisory Group. That was important to have a diverse range of people at the table and to engage with. And I read from the report we had today. In paragraph 8, the sessions focused on establishing how the different design elements and supported or detracted from achieving the objectives of the different stakeholder groups. And that's what it was about. Mr Mintz, in his report today, with what we've got in front of us, 
suggested that the preference should be informed by the importance and feasibility of providing an appropriate public transport service, meaning a service using smaller buses with an environmentally friendly fuel source. We all agree on that through George Street. He also commented that it may be appropriate to re retain two-way traffic through that period of the hospital rebuild to provide more flexibility to deal with the traffic effects of that project. When I look at the report that we have, when I listen to the submitters, when I, having attended two of the sessions as a member of the Centre City Advisory Group, there was really good engagement with the Centre City Advisory Group and from all voices. Jack Manning came up for a great idea, which was clearly articulated, that we basically have like a Lego modular system where you can move blocks around furniture, street furniture so you can adapt the street to suit. A lot was taken on board. We engaged. We got a preferred option. And there were some councillors. There was four of us in total at those meetings. But the one thing I've learnt at council is you listen to the experts, okay? You listen to the best guidance and the best information possible. And from what I'm reading here, the option we got, the preferred option, was option one. But that's not what we're voting for. And when I, I'm starting to get my head around it, yeah, there's not a lot of difference for some people between option one and option two. There was a reason we were given option one as a preferred option. It was about the engagement. It was about the experts. And to be honest, I feel gutted for some of the members of the Central City Advisory Group who weren't here to speak today. And to be honest, I'll put my hand on my heart and say, look, you know what? I failed. I should have gone and lobbied them and said, you come and speak. You come and be here today. I'll take that on the chin and I'll go and speak to them accordingly. Because others obviously got the memo that they could come and present. That's fine. That's what democracy is about. So I apologise to some of the members of the Centre City Advisory Group for not contacting them directly and making sure they were here for the public forum. There is a lot to be done here and the de detailed business case will go through that. The other thing being is I am really frustrated when I don't read about emergency services and others that directly are going to be impacted on this. There's nothing from transport professionals. We've taken a paper and we're not even going with the preferred option. That's what frustrates me the most. So I will be voting against this. Thank you. Um, I'll take a go. Um, I came into council as a newly elected member last year knowing that the previous council had taken a brave and enlightened step to endorse a truly forward-thinking preliminary design for George Street in 2019 that was set to create a fresh, people-friendly city centre that would breathe new life into a part of the city in need of a 21st century refresh. The work to get to that point occurred over a number of years. That vote was carried with only one vote against. Therefore, how do we single to, signal to all those progressive members of the Dunedin public who submitted over many years in favour of a far more people-centred, modern and forward-looking Dunedin? How do we signal greater ambition by us, the elected members? For me, by not, not by taking this safe, non-adventurous two-way option that goes counter to the swathes of people including those at the public forum today, who have visions of a truly forward-thinking, progressive 21st century city. In fact, a place with a strategic goal of becoming one of the world's great small cities. I have respect for many of Mr. Of many of Mr. Mentz's comments, in particular, design flexibility and the possible extension to upgrade Murray Place to the Octagon, which I hope is included in the forthcoming detailed business case and the clutter issue. And as Mr. Mentz has stated on many occasions, whatever we vote on today will provide significant improvements over what we currently have in George Street. That's obvious. However, I am a fan of the flexible one-way option 
In fact, I'm a fan of pushing for even more pedestrianized options. The rest of the world shows us that this can in fact enhance rather than hinder retail income. And of course, it's by far the superior option in terms of people's safety, public amenity value, for cyclists, for well-being for people on so many levels. And guess who lives in cities? Yes, people. Stakeholder groups by their very nature have their vested interests at heart, and that's understandable and sometimes valid. But as a governance team elected by everyone in this city, it's our job to be brave when looking out onto the horizon, understanding how things are changing in the world and what we need to do to plan for those changes we see coming our way. It's not our job as the city's governance team to be advocating on behalf of stakeholder groups alone. Their in input should only be part of a larger basket of information, data, evidence, and evidence we use when making wider long-term strategic decisions, particularly when it's made on behalf of all the citizens residing in this wonderful city. I support the motion in front of us for two main reasons. Firstly, it supports the many people in Dunedin who have supported the previous decision of council which passed through a robust and lengthy consultation process run by hardworking and dedicated staff. And of course, it's now, more, it's now even more robust. It's flexible. And I also support it because it shows strong governance in terms of future-proofing this city for generations to come. And if it doesn't pass, I urge all of you supporting the original 2019 model not to give up on pushing this council at every opportunity to be braver and more visionary when it comes to trying to make Otapoti one of the world's great small cities. Further speakers? Councillor Lord. Yep, thank you. Um, yeah, I've sat here and I've wondered about how to vote on this. I've um, been a person like Councillor Wiley referred to that usually follows uh, expert recommendations. Um, I've listened to people say it's visionary if you vote a particular way or not a particular way. I think if we were truly visionary, we would uh, pedestrianise at least three blocks. Um, so I don't consider that this in itself is particularly visionary. Um, I've heard Councillor O'Malley say that the, the um, platform of the road will be suitable for one or two way, and that was, you know, I sat there and I did, I was commenting to Andrew yesterday or this morning, saying I really couldn't see the difference between option one and option three, except that you force signal with whichever way what your preferred preference is. Um, but I, I can support this, but I'm, I'm very, uh, when, I, when I think about the young people, I, I've said it before in this room, I've got a son that tells me, Dad, if you wanted to do anything useful on um, council, you could, uh, you could uh, close the blocks where McDonald's and the Meridian is. Um, I don't know what he thinks I do the rest of the time, I suppose he, <laughs> he thinks I'm not useful on council, and um, perhaps that won't be a worry in the future for him, but you know, I can support this, so I could have supported the options. I, I think uh, to be, I don't like the idea of trying to, I don't think, I think we fool ourselves if we think we're gonna have a one-way street with two-way bus loop. I think the greater reality of it is, if people decide it's too long to sit on the bus, they'll walk back a block or a block and a half or whatever, or they'll plan their trips accordingly. Um, I think a one-way bus loop would be the preferred option if you've got a one-way transport to be quite honest. And um, yeah, look, it's a different view, but we're not as visionary as we think. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Benson Pope. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, most of you won't be surprised to know that the same arguments were actually used and the same concerns stated, mostly fallacious, last century when we were doing the work that's in place now. And you heard my comments about maintenance levels earlier. And I would challenge you all to make sure that whatever we decide, we make sure when we're talking about their long-term plan that we put in place the right amount or satisfactory amounts of money to make sure that whatever we do in the street is properly maintained, properly cleaned and properly repaired when it gets damaged. But whatever happens, we know that the status quo isn't working. Uh, we know that retailers are under greater pressure because of social change, internet sales, 
the challenges related to COVID, uh, the attempts of developers to uh, ensure uh, retail breakout to their own advantage. Uh, and I think it's absolutely critical that we take full responsibility for continuing to do what we've done historically to make sure that we retain one of the best shopping, shopping streets in New Zealand, without a doubt. Why is this whole issue on the table? Well, it's on the table because this council has a responsibility to make sure that our city centre, our showroom, our shop window, not retailer shop window, our shop window is the best it can possibly be for all our residents. And I acknowledge the comment that one of our colleagues has already made about that respect. Everyone in the city deserves to have a city centre they can be proud of, that's beautiful, that's inspiring, that's full of art, that's animated, and that belongs to everyone. Colleagues, this is public space. It's not the space of any vested interest. It's not the space that is beholden to the retailers or the property owners who happen to be situated lucky or clever enough to be situated on George Street. It is public space. It is the public domain and it belongs to all of us. And vested interest aside, and thank goodness for the enlightened vested interest by the majority of property owners who have done good things over serious de several decades to make their buildings look beautiful and attractive. And you've only got to walk down the street and have a look above the verandas to identify who they are. They know who they are and we should be very grateful for their efforts. They're not all like that though. And a lot of people can't see beyond the self-interest of what they think is the answer. When we did the work that's in place now, we were going to destroy pretty much every retailer in town. We know why we had to do it. Quite a similarity between what's driving this work right now. Last century, when that work was done, most of the retailers who'd grizzled most had the good grace to say afterwards, you were right, we're really grateful for the huge investment that's gone into our city's shop front and our, our own retail frontage. I also like to add that the Council's efforts, as is the case with this budget line, are entirely consistent with years of robust urban planning designed, amongst other things, to make sure that our central city was not destroyed by the sort of retail breakout that's done catastrophic damage to so many other parts of this and other countries. We're very lucky that our forebears made those judgments. We're lucky that our current planning rules require the same, much and all as they're constantly being bent and tested by those who have what they think are better ideas for their own personal profit. It is absolutely essential that this work proceeds, whatever its final configuration, and I'm certainly supporting the motion uh, that the Mayor has moved, but whatever happens, it's absolutely essential the work proceeds sooner rather than later to avoid other conflict and to also assist those people who are, it's acknowledged, finding it hard because of the other changes I talked about. Fair to say, we're all pleasantly surprised, aren't we, about the way retail mostly has held up really well. Sure, hosp hospitality and so on have found it harder, but we've all seen the month-on-month -month figures um, from the retail spend, and it's much better than other centres. And it's our responsibility to make the decision in the best interests of our community, our whole community, about the city's core public domain. It ain't private property, and it doesn't belong to a few vested loudmouths. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Hawkins, your right of reply. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. And speaking to this, I focused largely on um, what it means to have a city centre. And I use the term city centre 
on purpose, uh, as has been uh, a note from Councillor Benson Pope, rather than CBD or Central Business District, because uh, it mean, they mean very different things, and we are trying to create a city centre for our community, uh, as opposed to focusing solely on the needs or interests of uh, the businesses that happen to be contained within it. But I focus largely on talking about people. I do want to mention um, business interests, though, uh, in, in passing, and that is uh, we've got a very clear message, terrible, no pun intended, from uh, Tony Clear uh, through the work that we were doing uh, the last time we had the, the, the round the houses about this, and, and his comments were around the fact that high quality public space is the new anchor tenant uh, for, uh, for a successful commercial operation, and that is what we are investing in here. And because Councillor Vanderviz is um, relitigating the annual plan debate, um, and the cost is, has been mentioned, $60 million for surface treatments uh, is true enough for the entirety of the central city plan, only $28 million of which uh, will be spent in this portion of that, around half, give or take, of that would need to be spent to reinstate the existing uh, work when we repair the uh, water infrastructure below ground that is urgently required, regardless of any of our individual independent engineers' analysis. Uh, nobody is going to sit here and argue that this couldn't be done badly uh, or that this couldn't go wrong, and we've, we've heard a, a, a litany of failures uh, presented, uh, presented to us. Uh, but what the debate is about today is what it is that we want to achieve uh, and proceed through the detailed design phase to make uh, what our goals are uh, a reality. Uh, Councillor Houlihan, uh, mentioned that people can't get around now, um, which is tantalisingly close to understanding my point. Uh, it is difficult. Uh, it's getting harder at peak times uh, uh, for people to, to move around the city. What we need to do in response to that is to make it easier for people to not have to go about uh, their business in the way that they have, uh, they have been uh, compelled to or, uh, or have chosen to up until this point. Uh, we have to shift the dial on transport. It's the only way we're going to get anywhere near our zero carbon targets, uh, regardless of the, the status quo fantasy uh, that somehow electric vehicles are going to fix it and we can just carry on behaving exactly the same way ad infinitum uh, growing all the time. It's consistent uh, with our integrated transport strategy, which has very strong language around supporting mode shift for people for whom uh, that is a viable option. And this is uh, the kind of work that we need to do. Uh, Councillor Raddick has suggested that option, uh, option one, the recommended option, uh, would address all of CCS's uh, safety concerns or resolve them. That's not strictly true. They were quite clear that the distance required to travel from one side of the road was a considerable safety factor uh, for, uh, for their membership and for vulnerable users of which this uh, option uh, does a better job of that. Um, I, I find it interesting that the 6,500 people who signed Mr Wetherill's petition uh, are somehow valid and the 20,000 members of an organisation that came to present to us uh, at public forum aren't. And while I accept that there are certainly people and groups in this community who can valid, make a valid claim to being excluded from our processes and not to understand how our processes work, uh, with all due respect, Mr Bazette of George Street uh, is not a man who can claim to not understand how council processes work and decisions work, and the fact that they chose not to participate in some of our uh, discussions around George Street isn't something, isn't a cross that we should, uh, that we should have to bear uh, at this point. Uh, and finally, um, Councillor Elder, <laughs> and, and the idea that somehow if if people around the table knew the debate we'd be having uh, today around this option, uh, they could have gone and Councillor Wiley could have gone and drummed up some support uh, to come and make the opposite case at the public forum uh, is a case, I think, of saying the quiet bit uh, a little too loudly. Uh, but finally, uh, Councillor Elder mentioned uh, the idea of transition, and I agree, uh, but that is what this is. Uh, this is uh, a, a transition to uh, a more a future-focused 21st century way of conceiving how our city functions and who it functions for. Uh, this is, and, and we've heard that from, uh, from Mary O'Brien, we got it loud and clear from submitters back in 2017 when we were going through this process that this isn't anywhere near as ambitious as people in our community want us to be. This is a transition option, uh, but it is certainly uh, the best step in the right direction or the biggest step in the right direction that we have available to us, and I thank uh, councillors for their support in this debate today. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. I'll put the vote by division. 
and by section, is it right? Yeah. Oh, okay, so do you want to take A and C together? Am I clarifying that what A and C are together? Okay. Yeah, we're gonna take we're gonna take A and C together and then B separately by division. So it's A and C together. Oh, yep, so we're doing A and C together. Those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carried. Now we do B by division. Thank you. Councillor Barker? Aye. Councillor Benson Pope? Aye. Councillor Elder? No. Councillor Gary? Aye. Mayor Hawkins? Aye. Councillor Houlihan? Aye. Councillor Lafiso? Aye. Councillor Lord? Aye. Councillor O'Malley? Aye. Councillor Staines? Aye. Councillor Raddock? Aye. Councillor uh, Vandervis? No. Councillor Wiley? Chairperson, Councillor Walker. Aye. So the, the ayes have it. Nine, four, five against. The motion is carried. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, seems very anticlimactic going on to item 12. Items of consideration by the chair. Are there any? Councillor Vandervis. This was something that I was supposed to bring up and promised to bring up with Councillor Benson Pope some time ago, and that is that there have been a number of issues regarding uh, the shop front signage um, compliance with our rules. And the shop front compliance issue is not just limited to George and Princess Street, but quite a few other streets around, especially as it applies to size and positioning on verandas and Yep, verandas and canopies. So my request, which actually Councillor Benson Pope suggested some time ago, was that I bring this up with the chair of this committee um, to our staff to actually have a look at the compliance rules, uh, see if they're actually being uh, enforced, uh, whether anything needs to be done about them. Thank you. Anything else? Declare the meeting closed. <laughs> <laughs>